I grew up in the 70s, you know, 70s, and I was in high school in the 80s, but... I was I, already an adult. Yeah, but, yeah, I know. I know you're older than right. I am, but not that much, but still. Do you remember the CB radio? Yeah, we had one. We had several. Anybody out there got a bear report? Come back. But you uh, weren't truck drivers, were you? You didn't have to be. That was the great thing. Right. It's not just about truck drivers. I mean, that's the thing. It was a way of, uh, like you'd mentioned before... It was as a predecessor. In the take we're not using. In the take we're not using. <laughs> and in life, he yeah. said he's mentioned it. We've yeah. talked about this before, yeah. just between us, because yeah. it was a fun, fascinating kind of thing for the time. Uh, you didn't have anything else like that, right? Where you could, for a minimal amount of money, you could purchase the setup. You didn't need a like we had an antenna we put up at our house. Nice. And yeah. uh, my grandfather did, so he had uh, he actually actually had two because there's a beam antenna which looked like a big H, uh-huh. and then there was the uh, omnidirectional. God, right. well, I, I, amazed I'm remembering this now at the uh then the omnidirectional would would pick up from all the omnidirectional would pick up from all directions right but the range probably wasn't as good no, it, no neither of them were, were really good but I, and we're going to get to this i think what what scott's leading up to here well i mean this thing i at, uh there was a point when i was young uh when my mom my mom raised me alone and i because my parents were divorced and a very close relationship to my dad so no bad blood there but just you know where there was a time which my mom and i uh were moving from Colorado. Uh, yes, I was born in California, but um, I, until I was an eight or nine, I lived in Denver, Colorado, and my mom and I moved back to North Carolina, where the bulk of her family was. And on this trip, we had a CB. And, you know, we had a U-Haul truck with all our worldly possessions in it. And there did, was a did you CB. have a CB in the car? Yeah, it was in, in the, the vehicle. Truck. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, we, yeah. Uh, I think we bought it and, and brought it with us because she was nervous about us breaking down or whatever. And I was so into it. I'd studied all the, what they called the slanguage of yeah. CBC. Well, did you, CBC. you know, you're supposed uh, to what get it. They, they're supposed it. to get a license. Scott. Yeah, but no, did you know, license. did you know that? Yes, I did. But did, nobody did you, had licenses. What? Yeah. No, we did. Well, we all, of course we, you did. You're we took the, we, nerds. We, <laughs> <laughs> it's what you're supposed to do. You're right. Well, even to this, to this day, it, there was a lot of folks who do this as a hobby. And you, if you're broadcasting, and I think it depends on distance and how powerful the transmitter is. Well, up to a certain amount, you need to get a, you know, your, your radio DJs, they have a license. Well, you know, and I, I still license. remember some of the language because uh, one of the things it was the best for is, is talking to a truck on the, coming the other way, trying to find out what, what, if there were any cops ahead of you. You know, if you were speeding or whatever, so you would say, you see, uh, you know, breaker one nine for that portable parking lot uh, westbound on I-40. And they would come back and say, uh, yeah, you got the whatever their handle was. And you'd say, how's it looking over your shoulder? And they'd say, well, we had a smoky 10 miles right. back outside right. of where, you know, outside of Topeka or whatever. Yeah. So, you, you know, you get this. I don't know if 40 even goes through Topeka, but you get, you get my <laughs> idea. No, so, it's a lot. It's a live <laughs> traffic update from people on the ground. And now people just text that while they're driving. Yeah, and well, not you looking know, the CBs at their, are still out there. I mean, I have one in my Jeep. I only have it on for yeah. uh, trail rides, which is why, why I really need it, you know, for off-roading or whatever. But yeah. sometimes I'll turn it on on road trips. And, you know, that, that information is still being exchanged with truck drivers and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, well, you got to realize there's 40 standards. Standard channels. You yeah. can get a single sideband SSB, and then yep. that splits the channels. But truckers are mostly on 19. Yeah. Everyone else, you can pick a channel. Well, you know what? Uh, family FRS radios, the family radio service radios, that's kind of like the similar thing, although those are portable. Right. So a CB. Maybe a little you, walkie-talkie. Yeah, you yeah. have to have that. that it takes more buying. power. Yeah. You have to have it uh, hooked up in your car, and you need an antenna to right. be able to communicate. Right. So... Well, here, so here's the thing. We're on this trip, my mom and I, and I'm kind of a kid, and I'm just talking on the CB the whole time as much as she'll let me to all these people. So I'm having this, like, 10-minute conversation with this guy who's super cool, he's nice. I can't even remember, the, like, the bulk of the conversation. What I remember was that his handle was Pencil Pusher, and uh, my handle was Roadrunner, and I'm going to go ahead and admit that. <laughs> I think I was probably named it after the actual yeah. Roadrunner. Yeah. But, <laughs> but anyway, we were talking. He was a super yeah. nice guy. When you get to the end of the conversation, and up comes the question – which means where are you? Where are you located? Yeah. And he comes back to me and he explains that he was outside of Oklahoma City on I-40. And that's that's cool if we were anywhere near that. But we were on I-70 in Kansas, about 250 miles away from him. That's about the distance. Yeah. yeah. Roughly 250, 300 miles away. Right. I didn't know that at the time. I know it now. But it's, it's my understanding that this can, this can work all the way across the country. Uh, it, it, it has its limits, but it has to depend on uh, – it's basically an atmospheric anomaly. So I try to say anomaly in every episode we do. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 it happens when uh, the signal is bouncing off the ionosphere. Yeah. Right? And so I noticed as a kid it would happen more when – So an ionospheric anomaly. 
Well, there you go. Oh. Very good. <laughs> You've been practicing that. Yeah. We had a uh, heavy overcast, so in the winter, it worked really well. And also, if there was a lot of ice and snow on the ground, because it was it was bouncing. Back and forth, like a ping pong ball. <clears throat> yeah, but we could hear, uh, you know, I didn't live too far from the Canadian border, probably, you know, three or four hours, but you could hear some people in Canada, truckers occasionally, right, and a few states away. And so I think my grandparents, they lived probably a 30 to 40 minute drive away. But you shouldn't have been have been able to under normal conditions. But it right. can happen, right? And so, and and the reason I bring this up is because tonight we're going to come back to a theory that suggests that Amelia Earhart's last signal traveled halfway around the world. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook. I'm Forrest Burgess. And this is Amelia Earhart. Well, GP, you know it's because I want to. Amelia Earhart, when asked by her husband, George Putnam, why she was making this flight. Tonight, we're going to wrap up part two of our special on Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan's disappearance. Grab your notebooks, because this one is complicated. Unless, of course, you're driving. In that case, watch the road. So we had some pretty exciting news recently when Nick Tomeno of Coinbase contacted our show and asked us if we'd be interested in partnering with them to roll out a new Bitcoin tip widget they developed. It's certainly not going to make us rich, but considering our current revenue is zero, it's nice to have a tip jar on the counter, and we're grateful to Coinbase for blogging our participation in the launch of this micropayment option to their 2 million users. You can find the widget at the bottom of our homepage, as well as on each posted episode of the show. We're glad to be a part of that family. I want to also add that we are now up on Tumblr, and Google+, Plus, in addition to our Facebook page, which we already had, most of you probably already knew, and a Twitter page. Uh, but the best choice by far to follow us is the AstonishingLegends.com website, which we update uh, more frequently. And if you're enjoying our show, please remember to subscribe to us in iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn. Now, a few weeks after this show, we will be available on iHeartRadio as well. Okay, let's get into it. Good luck doing this one in an hour. Yeah, we're not going to, this one's not no. going to work in an hour. Okay, so why this is, you know, it's part two. But please stay tuned for the best four and a half hours <laughs> of theoretical and hypothetical discussion you've likely heard this week. Hey, well, this should please the people that we've been hearing from on Facebook and iTunes as well who wished we were weekly. Uh, you may be able to take this one and just break it in half. <laughs> <laughs> weekly. And the, well, that's kind of what Listen we do half this week you and know half what? next week. That was kind of the idea because, and I got to give a lot of credit to Scott because he's done an amazing amount of research and I hope it comes through. I hope you uh, hear that and appreciate it because that's the thing. You're not going to probably read all these books and do all the, uh, look at all the links and all the the blogs and pages that he has, but that's what our job is here. Call this down into a few really interesting ideas uh, to so you can form your own opinion. Right. And right. an informed, you, in, by the way, an informed <clears throat> opinion. We're also not going to try and uh, talk over each other, but I can't promise that. No, I know. We've had some complaints what? about that okay. as well. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I did, the first thing I want to say is that uh, in the first episode, part one of this Amelia Earhart special, which is what we're finishing up tonight, uh, we mistakenly referred to a lot of the hypotheses about what happened to her as theories, which is Wait, not actually Did, did we do that? Because yeah. Okay. Because you know what? I, as I was reading your, your note here, yeah. a lot of people just say theories. I think that's in the, the you know, the Yeah, theories vernacular. is not right, though. Yeah. Because, okay, so yeah. listen to this. A hypothesis is either a suggested explanation for an observable phenomenon or a reasoned prediction of a possible casual correlation among multiple phenomena. In science, a theory is a tested, well-substantiated, unifying explanation for a set of verified proven hypotheses. A theory is always backed by evidence. A hypothesis is only a suggested possible outcome and is testable and falsifiable. I got that from Diffin.com, which, by the way, D-I-F-F-E-N.com is an amazing website. It's just for comparing things. And proving people wrong at cocktail parties. Yeah, right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Here's the thing about all the hypotheses we're going to put forward tonight, and you're going to get sick of that word, and I apologize. Theory is a lot more fun word. It's, it's less like people are going to be, why <laughs> do they keep saying hypotheses? But he's gotten good at saying would, it, though, so please yeah. just, just indulge him. <laughs> just let him say it. But the bottom line is, like, what, one of the things that I found from doing all this research was that every single one of them, when you read it and you dive into it and you go down the rabbit hole, as I'm fond of saying, you're, you're mm. pretty much on board with it that one while you're looking at it then you come out of it and you sleep on it and the next day you get up and you're like oh well and you go back and you think oh maybe that one's right and then yeah. you go into the next one and you're like 
no, wait, this one is what yeah. happened. Well, but you know what? That's human nature. See, I, I used to edit more um, what we call features and benefits videos for uh, different car companies. And after you've edited one, uh, you're like, oh, my God, this is the best car ever. It's got everything. And then you, you get to the next project, and it's another manufacturer. Like, no, this is the best car ever. Right, it's right. got everything. Right. And, uh, no, it's just human nature that, you know, when, when uh, a, a series of facts are laid out, and if it's done halfway well, that's what it's supposed to do is, is kind of help you form an opinion. That's exactly right. And it, But the, here's the thing that I want to say. So after doing all the research that we did to get to tonight's show, which I want to hurry and get into, but the main thing I want to say is that I want to encourage our listeners to collect the stories of all the witnesses and all the data that we're going to share with you. And remember that just because witnesses are more prominently associated with a particular hypothesis, that doesn't mean they can't support an opposing hypothesis. So when you decide where you're going to put your money – you almost have to go back and reevaluate the radio calls, the eyewitness testimonies and everything, because while not all that evidence supports multiple theories, a significant portion of it can work for more than one of them. Tonight, we're going to tell you everything we found out as concisely as we can about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. It's hard to cover an almost 70-year-old mystery with decades of research in a single episode of our show, but we're going to try. Your mission is to listen to the show and the evidence we've collected, and at the end, Make your own decision. We're going to start an imaginary betting pool. Someday they're going to find something. Where are you going to put your money if you live to see that day? All right, so before we dive into the first hypothesis we're presenting tonight, we can make a somewhat educated assumption that out of all the ones we've researched, of the few that we're presenting tonight, it's reasonable to think that one of them has a high likelihood of being true. That means that all supporters, all evidence, and all witnesses are likely experiencing something known as confirmation bias. Unfortunately, odds are good that the supporters of the truth are experiencing it as well. And, so, and this is something that we need to address before we get into, the, into what we're going to cover tonight because it really affects everything that you find when you're researching something as controversial as this. Forrest, do you have do you have that entry on confirmation bias from Wikipedia? Yes, all eight pages. Yeah, okay, Wait, come okay. on. It's not that long. It's not <laughs> it's that a, long. It's a half a page. Okay. Ooh, and it's italicized. Okay. Well, you can skip oh, some All of right, it. here we go. So confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, or prioritize information in a way that confirms one's beliefs or hypotheses. The effect is stronger for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. People also tend to interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing position. Biased search, interpretation, and memory have been invoked to explain attitude polarization, which is when a disagreement becomes more extreme even though the different parties are exposed to the same evidence. This has a lot of big words in it, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, my, You're doing I'm good, getting a, getting a workout. <laughs> Don't stop now. Good. We're almost done. Yes, yeah, good thing I had that Charleston shoe. Yeah. <laughs> A series of experiments in the 1960s suggested that people are biased towards confirming their existing beliefs. Later work reinterpreted these results as a tendency to test ideas in a one-sided way, focusing on one possibility and ignoring alternatives. All right, so this is the point. Uh, Democrats and Republicans already know about oh, this. Oh, boy, Probably, you see, this uh, is, it shows up so much in political yeah, talk. It's yeah, it's everywhere. And th the thing is, if something is, is, is near and dear as Amelia Earhart or JFK or whatever, where you have a conspiracy oh, theory boy. swirling around it, people are going to come up with their line of thinking. And even well-educated, well-funded people are going to follow down these tracks. And when they get down them, even if they're not necessarily on the right track, they start to look for things that support the theory that they believe in. Right. I think they'll, even the things that you find that may not fit well, you hammer it into that hole to make it fit your theory, or you toss them out completely. Right. And, I, and this is the bottom line. I don't care how well-educated the participants are, how much money they have, how rational they are trying to be. There's no question that confirmation bias plays a huge part in our show tonight. I, and my, I myself am trying to stay rational and look at all the evidence in an open-minded way. But I'm afraid, just like Dr. Stance in Ghostbusters... I couldn't help it. It just popped in there. I've made a decision, and there's no way it's not going to influence our report tonight. I'm going to try not to let it do it, but you just have to know that I'm at least aware that that's happening, and I'm going to try to keep my bias in check as much as possible. I mean, have you made a decision as well? Well, I was going to say, with each of the, the, the hypotheses that we're presenting tonight, there's a great deal of evidential uh, truth and fact that we have found that's supported across all three platforms, if you will. However, at some point, if you count Jersey, 
Oh wow, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a well. You know that ties in though. <laughs> yeah. That, but that's this is the thing. At some point, they're all going to jump off to their own and different conclusions, but still remain in the area, except for New Jersey, right? <laughs> Which is New the is, is way it's it's on the other uh, side of the the other hemisphere. So, all right. So let's yeah. let's get down to uh, what I like to call timeline number one. Just to warn you guys, some of you are going to become obsessed with this because there's no way to get involved in it and not become a little obsessed with this. So no, I, I've, I've solved it. Yeah. Okay, I, yeah. No, well, I, I know what happened. Well, that's, well, that's what everyone I'm says. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. Yeah, right. right. So if you do become obsessed with it, we've compiled more links and information on this episode than any prior episode to help you get started. So be warned, many people have come and gone to their graves already, spending decades trying to get to the bottom of it. So we're going to start with the tiger theory, right? Yeah. Well, you. you uh, uh, ooh, I'm sorry. The oh. tiger hypothesis. No, is it because I always see tiger? Is it, it no? You it's say tiger. tiger. They say it, on their they own website, it okay. sounds like tiger. Yeah, <laughs> like, tiger is an acronym. It's it's kind of an Austin Powers type acronym. You know, <laughs> what was the it? International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery? Well, you know what? I, that's, it tells you exactly what they're about. It does. It yeah. does. Now, um, before we get to the tiger theory of what happened, we're just going to start and say this is basically what I like to call the castaway theory. You mean by that's their end conclusion? Yeah, that they, that they were castaways okay. on an island, All right. on a very small island uh, known as Nikomororo. So uh, let's get to So we covered in part one how they took off from New Guinea. Hey, let's let's kind of refresh them if, where they left off, or for the, the odd person that likes to listen to the part twos of things and <laughs> right. then go back to part one to fill the rest well, in. Well, part one was, you know, it's it, it was interesting, but it's it's not really about her disappearance. It's, it's, but it's all the background. And, and no, and you know what? It. I, was, I will say, Scott, there's some very important information because it all leads to likely of things happening later and and reasons for the for these for this kind of thinking. That's right. That's right. So, on July 3rd of 1937, Pan Am using some stations that they had set up, here's calls from three different islands triangulating the final position of Earhart and Noonan's aircraft, the Electra Tinney, toward the Phoenix Islands. Additionally, on top of this, there were radio signals received by a girl in Wyoming who thought she heard Amelia saying she was on a reef south of the equator. Now, something that's important about this, the Millie Atoll, which will come up later in another hypothesis, is north of the equator, for what it's worth. Now, if they're lost and crashed or castaways or whatever, I'm not sure how they know where the equator is anyway. <laughs> well, well, that's but, a, no, that's an important thing, because they could, where they thought they were could have been way off from right. where they were supposed to be. Exactly. So and there was another woman in Canada who said that she heard Amelia say the navigator was badly injured. Uh, this is something else that will come up in, in one of the hypotheses later. So we're just we're getting around to yeah. all of these uh, supposed radio signals, and some of them they call post loss signals, which was after the plane theoretically went down wherever post it went loss. Down. Okay. Post loss, well, that's yeah. Interesting. So okay. the, the aircraft is lost, but they're still right. able to communicate. Uh, the most important one of these uh, was Betty Clink, who we made a reference to. We had a quote from her in part one of the episode, and. Uh, just quickly, I want to make a correction on that. We had said that her antenna that her dad had rigged up to their shortwave radio was 60 feet. But in fact, Tiger reports that it was 120 feet outside of the house. And its original layout is diagrammed with a site plan of their house and their lot and how they had stringed it across the lot next door on Tiger's website. We have a link to that on our yeah, website. Yeah, you know, my, uh, my dad strung one up because he, he had built this uh, – it was just a receiver. We couldn't we couldn't transmit. Right. But you could tune in, uh, yeah, radio stations from around they the world. They couldn't transmit either. Same yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. But uh, but I remember the antenna was like – I was because I asked my dad about this, and it was it was horizontal. It's just basically a wire that we strung between two trees. And now if you look at other people who have ham radio operations, they have the, they have a very large tower – yeah. Uh, that goes above the house, and well, you I have can, a neighbor here. With oh, that. you do. Pretty okay, sure that's why. I so can't that that, use my <laughs> that that's why he's transmitting, <laughs> right? And probably why you're growing hair in weird places, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's genetic. But okay. anyway, uh, so the most noted witness out of all these supposedly post-loss radio calls was Betty Clink, who we made reference to in part one of this show. Now, Betty was in Saint Petersburg, Florida. And she, at the time, was a teenage girl, and her favorite thing to do was to sit on the floor and listen to that shortwave radio with that 120-foot antenna. She listened to music, and she had a little notebook there, and like all teenage girls, she would draw doodles in it. And when she heard a song she liked, she would actually write down the lyrics. So she was just sitting there waiting for something like this to happen. So she's tuning the dial around, trying to find things, trying to listen to stuff, and then suddenly she comes in and hears these sort of garbled signals. And she hears what she thinks is Amelia Earhart stating that they are, you know, that they've crashed, the water's coming in, and she hears a man talking, and there's a struggle, and he's like, let's get out of the plane, all this kind of stuff that she's hearing, and she kept notes on. And we have a link to the, her actual notebook, which is also on the Tiger website. 
again, as I said earlier, evidence like this can support any one of the hypotheses we're putting forward tonight. But Tiger owns this particular evidence as much as they can as supporting theirs. Now, this is post-crash, keep in mind, right? right? Okay, because the, the, This uh, implies yeah. that the plane is down uh, on, and still on, able to transmit. On July 2nd, right? right. It went down. So That's this is right. July, now it's starting on July 3rd. Right. Just a few hours, you know, later. And Betty kept hearing... New York City over and over, what she thought was the phrase New York City, New York City, in the middle of all these uh, conversations and transmissions. Now, one of the main members, founding members of Tiger, is a man named Richard Gillespie. And Richard had come to the conclusion or suggested that what Amelia might have been saying was Norwich City. What's the significance of this? Well, the significance is that Tiger's theory is that the plane crashed on a reef on an island called Nika Mororo. Uh, which used to be called Gardner Island. And Nika Mororo is a very small island. It's about four miles long. It has a lagoon in the middle that's maybe a mile wide. And it has a shelf, a reef shelf, that at low tide is in very shallow water. Yeah, a, fr- a fringing reef? Yeah, that, exactly. Right. Yeah, okay. and it, which drops <clears throat> off very steeply on, on the edge. But it's it's suitable to land an aircraft or or ditch an aircraft like the Electra. So the theory was that that they came down on Nika Mororo and they were able to transmit there because the plane was still more or less intact. Now, an important thing to note is that the the radio ran off a generator that was powered by the starboard engine. The engine had to run to charge that battery. So maybe they have a little bit of transmission with it off, but not very much. I would think more, though. Yeah, I mean, they're saying that uh, it, 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 for no not a significant amount of time. Right. After the engines have cut off. Right. But if it's got a battery, even the most primitive batteries, it'll hold a charge. It, it could go for a little bit. It should hold a sure. charge for a little right. bit. But in theory, if you were going to be transmitting for days or even or hours. Yeah, even, you're not going to get very much the out The engine would theoretically have to be running, which would mean that the landing gear would more or ha- less have to be intact and that the prop would have to be clear of the water so that it could run. Right. So, I mean, these are all theories about, like, can can they make a radio transmission from here? So, anyway, they're having these conversations. And a lot of people think that Betty Klink actually heard... Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan struggling. Now, what Tiger thinks is that this is indication that they were on Nika Mororo right. and that the plane eventually was destroyed by the tide and that they had to get out of it right. and ditch it and that they moved to the island and basically became okay. castaways. Can I just say, you're, you're starting off with some assumptions here, too. Yes. Uh, yeah. Norwich City as New York City. Oh, I forgot to mention. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot to say what the Norwich City was. Um, yeah. Going back to that. The Norwich City ran aground in a storm in late 1929 with 35 people aboard. All hands abandoned ship because a fire started, and and this was in a storm. So they had to make their way across this treacherous reef, which is not easy to walk on, in storm waves to get to shore on the island. Anyway, the survivors from the Norwich City camped on what was left of the old coconut farm, and uh, during their time after they abandoned the ship, three bodies of men lost in the storm washed up and were buried on the island. So all told, there were 24 survivors, and 11 men were lost. In the report of the survivors' time on the island, they noted a five-foot tide, which is important because if the plane is sitting out there on the reef, that's telling you that the water could, could be coming up as much as five feet, depending on where the tide was at when they landed, right? So mm-hmm. the bottom line is this. The Norwich City was there. The bow of it was sitting on the reef, and the stern was hanging out over the water. Yeah. And But even with that, it was, I think, eight or ten years before the stern finally broke loose. It, it cra- the, the ship actually cracked in half. Yeah, and the yeah. stern went down. It fell right. off a cliff into the deep, deep water. But was, the bow was still there. Uh, okay. Yeah. And you can look at pictures of the Norwich City. Yeah. And on the bow, on the port side, like you can on every ship there right. is, you right. can clearly read the name Norwich City. Yeah, yeah. So Rick Gillespie has posited from Tiger... Uh, who is, you know, the main supporter of Tiger and sort of the coordinator of all their operations right. re- relating to Amelia Earhart, which is not the only aircraft they're trying to recover, but it's obviously their biggest project. Sure. He posited that what Betty Clink was hearing on the radio when she said New York City, New York City, was that she didn't, that Amelia didn't know what island she was on, and she could see the wreck of the Norwich City and was saying Norwich City, Norwich City. Yeah. So, so but that's the thing. What you're, no, just to conclude here. Yeah. The bow of the ship and the name on it, still at that time, uh, for, was visible. for a fact, visible. Yes, okay. was for a fact visible. All right. Because the shipwreck was only eight years old, and it was two more years before the stern broke off. So right. in theory, the whole vessel was there, 
when they theory, when they hypothetically <laughs> no, but you say in hypo- theory and hypothesis yeah in yeah. hypothesis no no it's yeah. in theory yeah that's yeah. what you say in theory the whole so. vessel was there when they landed okay well no the, okay so this is the uh, again though when you say when they landed that's an assumption right 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 that's an assumption because nobody hit well now you're going to get to this i'm i'm sure uh we're we're going to get to physical evidence right okay. so <clears throat> oh, and the uh, the other thing about the engines running to power the batteries is that they use six gallons of fuel per hour when yeah. they're on, just so you know. So oh, that's depends a, that's on how much fuel you have. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, a lot of people are, you know, getting back to our cold open while I was talking about the CB, people are wondering how would Betty Klink have heard this radio call in St. Petersburg, Florida from an airplane that's ditched halfway around, literally halfway around the world right. in the Pacific Ocean. And that is a result of something called harmonics, which is where frequencies get doubled and the signal travels. And this gets really complicated. Yeah. And I read a lot about it, and I still can't explain it. Is, but suffice yeah. it to say, radio communications experts have confirmed that it is possible for harmonics to cause it to bounce halfway around the Earth. Is, no, so what you're saying is that that's similar to skip. Yeah, it's okay. very similar to Skip. But and not on the top same of thing. that, no, no, not not the same thing. Right. And on top of that, um, the the range in which Betty had indicated that she had the dial yeah. has been confirmed as a reasonable range to have picked up those signals, which she was, I think, in the twenty five megahertz range or something like okay. that. Again, I'm not a radio expert. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, clearly. <laughs> okay. So Tiger thinks that the plane was lost. They couldn't find Howland Island, which was their original destination. So they turned south towards these islands and they ditched on the reef, on the shelf reef yeah. of Nikamororo or Gardner Island. Is this part of Fred Noonan's Hypothesis. plan? <laughs> Is this part of Fred Noonan's plan to do a ladder uh, kind of – because it couldn't no, sight that, it. that – that comes up oh, later in hypothesis okay. number two. I have not heard that suggested with relation to this okay, hypothesis. Gotcha. All okay. right. So, so we're already starting to diverge a little. Yes, we are. Because this is, this is I guess, uh, to recap here, what I'm getting at. Uh, she, she takes, takes off from Papua New Guinea. Yeah. On land. And uh, and this another thing, a, a guy was uh, in radio contact with her. At, on the Itasca at Howland Island. But also, is but also in uh, But also in Ley, New Guinea. Yes. Because this is Eric Shader. So, right. It, so at some point, we start to lose a little bit of factual, semi factual yeah. contact Things with are her. Drifting. And then the hypotheses start to build. Right. And we'll come around to this later, but the bottom line is this the operator of the airport or the main airline in uh, Papua New Guinea was Eric Chater. He had radio contact with her for a while. Good two way radio contact. Yeah. The Atasca, which was set up specifically to help her find Howland Island, which was her destination, which was, you know, 25, 2600 miles away yeah. from. It was, a, it was a picket ship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A Coast Guard ship. Um, they had a whole plan to help her and communicate with her, but they never once had two-way communication with her. Right. They heard her. Right. They don't know for a fact if she ever heard them, but they heard her. There was no effective back and forth. It didn't seem them. like – it didn't seem – the way she was responding or calling out. She wasn't – I'm sorry. She wasn't responding. She was calling out. And the way that that sounded, it, it sounded like they, she couldn't hear them. Right. Right, but let's let's not. Okay. We'll, come, we'll right. come back to that on our on our second hypothesis. Gotcha. So the long and short of this is that that what Gillespie thinks and his group Tiger thinks is that the plane has gone down on Nikamororo, that it was relatively intact. They even cited a, an older picture which had a uh, something in it that they called the dash dot or the um, uh, the I think the Bevington object. I might be misnaming that, but they 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 surmise that this thing sticking out of the water. In an old, old picture, a visit to the island just a year or two after she had crashed was possibly a broken off landing strut because the Mm. reef, obviously, even though it's a little bit underwater and it's more or less flat, it's coral. It's got holes in it or whatever. If the plane comes down, it could easily be yanking things off the bottom of the plane. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they've been looking for that and they're looking at these fuzzy old pictures, trying to figure out if that's that landing gear. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. That's gone. It's never been recovered. You know, it fell in a hole. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, and right. I got to try to be like, um, again, my bias, my confirmation bias is showing. Yeah. But anyway, so they think that they're on the side. Now, over the course of years and years and years, they find all kinds of things on the island. They yeah. find evidence of bones. They find this broken jar that supposedly had this freckle cream in right. it that they're saying was right. the kind that she used. They find yeah. a piece of a shoe. Yeah, a heel of a shoe. And yeah. they find the thing uh, ultimately that... Uh, oh, a, a knife that had been taken apart. Oh, a knife that yeah, had been taken yeah, apart right. for spear fishing. You know, had been su- specifically banged open, and they surmised that it had been disassembled for spear fishing. It wasn't found. The blade was not attached to a right. spear or anything. Yeah. 
these are all the things that they found and that they they looked at over the years and they made numerous expeditions, which, you know, of course they had to have funded and they're going back, you know, that we have half a million dollars. We're going back. We're going to look for more proof. There's been um, renowned and respected archaeologists involved with the project. All these projects have high level professionals pursuing the the ideas that they're after. Now, right. There's things to there's things that I feel. For instance, a knife that's broken apart to spearfish with uh, doesn't necessarily imply castaway. Like uh, any no. indigenous people might find a knife and make a spear to spearfish with. Yeah, now you have to keep in mind. Uh, there was also a Coast Guard radio station yeah. there for several years. Oh, sure, no, no. There, there's been a lot of people. I mean, there's so these are so remote, and there's such right. specks in a vast ocean, but. Keep in mind, people have been uh, stopping over on these things, uh, looking for uh, habitable islands, right. as well as, and then you get into the, uh, I would say, from the 1820s onward, ships stopping by, mining guano, yes. uh, whatever they're doing. But there's been a lot of people on these little islands. So it's not like these have never been stepped on. Right. And it, and the other thing to remember is, like I said earlier, uh, the SS Norwich City, they buried three people on the island themselves. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah. And that's something that nobody talks about. Now, theoretically... Um, good forensics would point to the fact that those are the people that, you know, died in the Norwich City crash yeah. or whatever, or shipwreck, I should say. But additionally, the other thing about a lot of this evidence that Tiger has found is that the the bones that they found in a pit that they surmised might have been hers, I, I believe, from best I can tell, were proven to be uh, that of a child of a of a, a someone yeah. of Polynesian descent right. or, you know, yeah. Micronesian descent. Yeah. Uh, the so there was no genetic link between those bones and Amelia, and the shoe is actually a man's shoe, and right. it was off two by sizes. two sizes. Yeah, right, yeah. right. See, so none of this stuff is really a smoking gun. the The only other thing that they found, well, actually, before I get to the other thing, let's just talk about survivability on the island. Yeah, I have here the report of J. Thomas, the first a J, the initial J, not his name J. Right. Uh, Thomas, who was the first officer of the Norwich City talking about what happened after they shipwrecked there, which was, uh, as I said, about uh, eight years before she crashed. Water was our greatest trouble, but after the prolonged rain which existed at the time of our stranding and throughout the first day and night, we found quite a lot of brackish water on a guano dump to the northeast of the lagoon. Although this does not sound to be very drinkable, we were all more than glad to take our ration of it after it had had a good boiling, and we experienced no ill effects." No, thank you. Anyway, um, <laughs> following the first day, but you, you know, you do what you have to do to survive. Following the first day of dry weather, this pool of water was non-existent, but we had collected sufficient when the opportunity offered to have lasted us about three weeks, should we have had no more rain. Fortunately, we were not called upon to stop more than four days before the rescue ships arrived, and on the afternoon of the fifth day, the last of the survivors were transferred from the island to the rescue ships. J. Thomas, late chief officer of the stranded SS Norwich City. So right there, that points to the whole castaway theory. And this is not anything against Tiger. They have never said that they lived there for years and years and had right. fam- Swiss Family Robinson or anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> but throughout the research that we've done on this island, I found that simple shifts in the weather have made it go from slightly inhabitable to uninhabitable for months oh, yeah. at a time. Yeah, it's it's look. It's only about six uh, six to eight feet above sea level. Right. Maybe maybe a little bit more. And uh, there's not a lot of vegetation on it. You right. have uh, nothing that collects. You know, you need fresh water. You cannot drink seawater, and you can't boil it to. Uh, now they obviously survived on brackish water, which is kind of a mixture, and yeah. I'm sure it tastes a little salty. But guano, uh, and and you got guano. So there's I can you, still you know, smell the guano <laughs> just from when you would take it when I would take a sailboat yeah. out of Marina oh, Del Rey. Right. On the rocks. On the way out to yeah. Catalina, it's, it makes you want to pass out. It's Well, there's a lot of ammonia in it, which makes it good fertilizer. The thing that Tiger has going for it is they are very good at the art of publicity. And one of the things, the whole reason that we decided to do this show was because they are the ones that came out and said, hey, you know what? We have this piece of her plane. We have, this, was a, this was two or three weeks just ago. Just a few weeks ago. Okay. They were like, we have found a piece of her plane. And they call this piece of her plane Artifact 2-2-V-1. And they claim that it matches her plane and that they, they have gone, and there's even a video of this, of them going to another Electra Tinny. They're holding it up on the outside of the plane, on the inside of the plane, and saying, look how it lines up and everything is right. And you know what? And there's experts with them and there's people that agree with them. I personally feel like it's not exactly a match, but mm-hmm. it, was, it was for a patch of a window on the back of her plane. And so what their hypothesis is, is that 
the picture was taken in Miami. I can't remember where, yeah. but at some point, the the plane had a window that used to be a hole for him to take. Uh, well, this is, this is what but I thought. It was, it, there was celest because uh, he used celestial navigation. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. And it was really good at it. Right. Uh, however, Newton, yes, Newton. exactly. And then uh, what happened is that that got damaged, or for some reason they had to they, took they it decided down. to patch it up. Right, right. So in Miami, I believe it was Miami on one of their stops. They they got a piece of aluminum and they patched it up, and you can see it very clearly in a picture that there's a piece of aluminum there. And mm-hmm. what Tiger is saying is that this piece of aluminum that we found on the island of Nicomororo, we're you know ninety five percent sure, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm making that number up. I'm not sure, but but they're basically <laughs> they're saying, pretty sure they're pretty sure that it's a piece of her plane. Yeah. So when you start to really dig into that, and this is what I'm talking about, now we're getting down, we're past the rabbit hole, we're going down into the rabbit warren, the rabbit den. Uh, The bottom line is this. They found that piece of metal in 1991. It wasn't found a month ago. It wasn't, you know, and then it hit the press and all that stuff. They found it in 1991. And one of the first things that, uh, that Tiger did was send it to a man named Elgin Long, who was an expert in yeah. uh, retired Navy captain, yes. pilot, yes. naval pilot, pilot w- who yeah. held several records. We'll be coming back to him yeah. later, but he's also an accident investigator. V- very respect, well respected, yes. uh, very cr- credentialed. Yes. Yeah. And so they asked him to take a look at that artifact. And this is in 1992. Yeah. And tell him whether or not he thought it was a piece of the plane. He, they didn't send him the actual artifact. They sent him a mock up of it. But nevertheless, it was considered to be an accurate representation. And he compiled a bunch of experts, and they all got together. And one of the one of them owned two Lockheed Electras. Another one was the actual retired engineer <laughs> this, this, who yeah. built, uh, who was supervising the shop that built Amelia Earhart's plane. So they took a look at this piece of metal, and they they basically said, you know what, this doesn't match. There's no way that this matches her plane. And then apparently, uh, Mr. Long posited that he thought it was off a of Catalina PBY, which you can see a picture of that plane on our website, but that's basically kind of a flying boat. It's a plane you've seen a thousand times. It looks kind of like the plane from Fantasy Island. Well, if yeah. Really if, if, to, but that was a Grumman. Yeah. Yes. If you watch a lot of old World War II movies, na- you know, naval uh, battle movies, yeah. it's, it's a very common, very sturdy, dependable aircraft used quite a bit during World War II. Right. It looks like a boat. It's got a big chin that looks like yeah. a deep V. And Pontoons the on each on the side uh, and, of the, yeah. the wingtips and all that. Yeah. So Long's people said, hey, you know what? This is off the top of a PBY assembly, apparently. Yeah. But the main thing they said is, aside from that, is there's no way this came from her plane. There's another very important note about that, which they did not say in 1992. It is clearly stamped with the letters AD on it, which means that it originally said all clad. The words all clad 24 ST appeared on all the aluminum that was built after 1941. There is no evidence of any aluminum prior to 1941 saying all clad 24 ST. So the AD that is on this piece of metal that Gillespie is saying is from Earhart's plane shouldn't have been on aluminum until several years after her plane was built. So the the bottom line is there these markings do not line up. And we have a link to a whole website that is devoted to nothing but markings on airplanes from this era, okay? So what what's happening here is that, you know, in addition to all of this, there was an article written in 1992, which, which Mr. Long participated in, in the Los Angeles Times, right? And where he talks about examining the piece of metal and how, you know, I said it, it probably came from a PBY. Actually, they don't mention that it came from a PBY in that article. I guess that oh. was something that he said later, or maybe the Times left it out. So, yeah. So the, here's the important thing about – this is very confusing. Yeah. So here's the important thing about the article. There was a gentleman quoted in the original article in 1992. He was the retired director of quality reliability for Lockheed. And he uh, worked on, and he worked at Lockheed when Earhart's plane was built. Was this the guy who was the assistant foreman of the uh, the fuselage shop? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. All right. And so, and he said, and I quote, "Nobody repaired anything at Lockheed." And this is a, you know, goes back to how did they patch that window? Would they have patched it with a piece of aluminum like this? Yeah. Nobody repaired anything at Lockheed without taking it back to its original configuration, as dictated by the airplane's federal certification. He said, under such rigid controls, it would be unthinkable that any worker or inspector would allow a repair where the riveting missed a complete line of attachment to a fuel sludge stiffener, which is the case with this piece that Tiger has found. Mm. All right. So he's saying there's just no way it's going to work. And here's the the even more interesting thing. The battle is raging on to this day, just 13 days prior to us posting this episode, 13 days ago from when you're hearing this, if you've downloaded it with, you know, relatively quickly after we posted it. 
Gillespie and Tiger updated their website with a well-researched rebuttal to Long's identification of the piece of metal being from a Catalina PBY. And he addressed specifically the comparisons between it and the upper wing of the Catalina and basically took apart how it could not possibly be from the Catalina, which, by the way, was known to fly to and from the island, Nicaragua, from 1944 to 46 when there was a Coast Guard radio station there. In this rebuttal, though, Tiger and Gillespie don't say anything about the stamping argument. They do not address it at all about mm. whether it's the big contentious correctly. point. Yeah, yeah, which is a very contentious. So why isn't that there? You know, and so here's where we get into the thing about Tiger. Tiger has also been sued by a man whose last name is Mel, and I can't remember his first name. He's a Utah resident who gave them $1 million for one of their expeditions. Ah. This gets into a whole other yeah. thing, and I, you know, I want to be very careful here. Yeah, we don't want to get litigious yeah, or, no, or, or not, against us. I yeah, mean, to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they, they, are, they have been sued by this man who has said that he, they solicited, uh, I, I believe— this yeah. is what happened. They solicited um, a donation from him for an, an expedition or several expeditions in spite of the fact that they had, quote unquote, already found the plane. So this man thinks that they found the plane already. Really? Yeah. He has reason to believe. Well, and he bases that on this video called the wire and rope video. OK. Uh. And we have a link to this on our website. This is a video that Tiger made with a undersea with an ROV, which is, I have to say, a little bit clumsily operated. Mm-hmm. It's going all around, and they're, they're finding this like steel aircraft wire, which rumors have had it had been on the island for years. And yeah. the indigenous people had said, "Well, when our people first came here, there was a plane, there was a wrecked plane here, yeah. that sort of thing." So there's all these kind of like rumors contributing to that. So they sent this ROV down with a camera, and they're filming this. And if you go on to the the message boards at the Tiger website, which are all open, every there's mu- a lot of transparency with the site. Whatever you say about Tiger and that organization, they're very transparent. Yeah, they're very well documented. Yes, I mean, they keep very yeah. well documented, yeah. and it's all up there for the world to see on their site. You can spend hours there, and, and I have. But uh, <laughs> in the right. forum, you can see that they, they're looking at this wire and rope video, and then they're pausing on these frames and trying to identify what looks like a plane seat or a dashboard or whatever. And I am telling you, I have never seen a more obtuse image yeah. that doesn't look like anything that people are drawing like red lines uh, and saying, Oh, right. look, it's a chair. I'm just like, right. I guess the thing that's mind boggling to me, and this is, and it's my opinion. Like, yeah, I I'm all the evidence about Nico Mororo is circumstantial. There is not one single smoking gun with respect to the, this is definitive. They haven't found especially a really good smoking metal, gun. That, yeah. Especially that piece of metal. Right. Right. Which they found in 91. And now it's like, well, you know what? We need some money to go back. So, oh, here's a press release. Uh, I see. I mean, yeah. I don't know. And then we come back to the confirmation bias. Maybe these guys are just really convinced that the plane is there. Yeah. And they have a sonar an- anomaly that they want to investigate. They want to go back in June of 2015. Uh, just a few months here. Yeah. And they want to look at this anomaly that their side scan sonar picked up that they're saying could be the Electra's fuel sludge on the side of the reef that yeah. had like gone down the edge. And they're trying to raise money for that. And lo and behold, they go back to this 1991 artifact. Yeah. So you, you can draw your own conclusions on that. I'm not saying anything about it. It's just it's it's my opinion that this operation isn't really convincing me that it's yeah. on the right track. It's That's the thing. This reminds me a little bit of Bob Ballard, he found the Titanic. Right. And, uh, you know, and of course, it spawned all this other research and movies and uh, everything else you've heard. But so what you're, but what you're getting at is that there's no really good smoking gun. No, there It's isn't. not like they found her attache case. No, which is something okay. we'll get to later. But right. I, I, Sorry, that was a really bad... By the way, that gun's not smoking either. No. Because it's nowhere. But anyway, let's, yeah. let's come back to it. Okay. So this is the bottom line. Up until now at least till this moment when we're releasing this this podcast, is c- circumstantial evidence. And if I was in that imaginary betting pool that I brought up earlier, I personally am not putting money on this. I'm not putting money on that piece of metal. That, and yeah. by the way, all the news outlets picked it up. It's solved, solved. That's what all these people say. Yeah, Every were, single yeah, one of these dramatic. hypotheses, yeah. it's solved. We found her. This is definitely right. what happened. And it's like, no. Or, or it's a no. tease, like, maybe we found it? No. You know, it's like, it's just, yeah. It's yeah, a, but the headlines are like, oh, no, this is a piece of her plane. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, well, that's what happened. It's like, no. Right. This piece of metal doesn't line up yeah. for a variety of reasons, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So, but, you know, this, this, what we'll get into later here, I think in the third, the segment of this, the third yeah. hypothesis. Yes. It, it really comes down to human nature, which in this part of that I find very fascinating because it's, it's what will you believe 
and how do you come how do you come to that and right. uh because this is not none of these things are new again 1991 we're going to go back even earlier to uh right. to different hypotheses and and people saying like no I'm telling you this is what happened and the, most of the world saying like okay yeah well yeah never mind well and 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 that's the thing and, and frankly I'm amazed that like if if tigers being sued by somebody who's saying they've already found the plane and it's a situation where I don't think the plane's there at all yeah maybe it's going to be there no. maybe the plane but you is know there. what this is Honestly, again we're, maybe it's there I just I don't think it is you and I are basing this on what's been presented by them Right. Okay. It's nothing that we researched and, and said, oh, well, we researched this this piece of metal. It doesn't line up for us. Right. We're going off of what p- other people have said, of course. Right. And the, we're, you know, like what the show is about, we're drawing conclusions based on things that we have found about, uh, you know, st- things that interest us. So my point is, is that uh, it's not like they they had an underwater camera and they took a picture of an airplane, a fuselage right. that's down there. And no. it's some kind of World War II plane. I'm not sure. It could be one of several uh, but they think it's uh, the Electra, so they need money to go down and and take a better look and and bring it up and solve this mystery forever. Right? There's no there's no fuselage. No, there isn't. And yeah. th- this is another important thing. Long himself says, and in because uh, in search of covered this. Yeah. In the back in the seventies, a lot of you probably never heard of the show in search of. It was an amazing. It's show awesome with yeah. Leonard, Leonard Nimoy. Nimoy. Yeah. Unsolved mysteries would be nowhere without in search of. A determined search for a solution to the Amelia Earhart mystery has followed many intriguing routes. Two independent investigators now believe that the final answer is very close at hand. You know what? Yeah. All these stories have been told before. Right. They cover it back in, uh, you know, the 70s at some point. I don't know when that episode these came are no, out. These were known things. Yeah. yeah. But Elgin Long is on there as a younger man. We're going to yeah, come right. back to him right. in a minute. And he said, here's an important thing to remember about airplanes that have gone down in the water. In shallow water, yes, it's a problem. They corrode. Yeah. You lose track. There's coral or whatever. Deep water, they're intact. Yeah. So, you know, if if... If, in fact, Gillespie's team has found it on the side of the reef and it's not that deep, it is theoretically possible that it would be covered in coral and very hard to identify. Sure. As opposed to sinking in deep water yeah. and just sitting on the bottom of the ocean right. where coral doesn't really live. Yeah. So, anyway, that's that wraps it up for theory number one. All right? Okay, yeah. That wraps it up. They, yeah. You know, they crashed on the oh. reef. They made some radio calls. They were castaways. They died from lack of water. Oh, by the way, they, they did fly over during the search, yeah. the massive search that right. FDR ordered right. for them, hundreds of airplanes. I believe in I believe in a three weeks' time, they had covered 250,000 square miles. Right. Yeah. Which, by the way, also a great way to survey the South Pacific in the case of war. Oh, talk um, about that. Yeah, well, we'll come back to that. But And when they buzzed that island, they saw signs of recent habitation. Right. But no living beings. Yes. Uh, and nothing that was like a red flag. So they flew over it within yeah. two or three days, actually. Yeah. So I would think, you know, I, I guess Tiger says, oh, well, the storm or storm came or something and took the plane down into the reef. But it's like, if you're there two or three days later, I think you would be, see it. Yeah. I, I, well, know, that's the thing. And I, how could they miss it? How could Earhart and Noonan, are yeah. they going to already be dead two or three days later? They're not yeah. out there like frantically waving their shirts. Right. And there's, I, there's, I it's know. not like a, it's there's no... strange about that. You know what? There's no heavy vegetation canopy yeah. covering anything. Yeah. I mean, I think there's waist-high grasses. At least nowadays there are. And I know that this changes because there's been reports of, again, people... Yeah, it uh, dries out. It, it dries you know, out. It yeah. grows up again. I think nothing... Even when uh, the shipwreck was there, uh, the Norwich City, yeah. I think the report was that there was nothing over like their people's heads. Yeah. And and, and if you hear a plane, you're going to be on the beach or you know the, yeah. the limited uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the even fringe if, there, even waving he, frantically. Exactly. And I'm sorry, I interrupted you multiple times there, but <laughs> even if even if Noonan had a head injury and had passed away, like yeah. the second day, Earhart would, in theory, still be running around. Right. Or, the, I mean, I wouldn't think that the plane. I mean, it took the Norwich City was only half on the reef, and it took it ten years to break in half. Right. You're tell me the plane was gone in three days or yeah. four days. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway. Okay. Let's move on. Yes. To, they died there, though. That's the. That's, that's the. Th- yeah. That's this theory says yeah. that they. They couldn't find Howland Island. They turned south towards the towards these islands because yeah. they knew where they were. Uh, towards Gardner Island. They ditched yeah. on the reef, and she radioed in and yeah. said, hey, we're here on this reef. Come, please come yeah. help us or whatever. But where's the bodies? And, Where are the bones? Uh, well, that's the other thing. Okay. No bones. They thought they had bones, yeah. and they weren't bones. They okay. found a lighter. Turned out the lighter right. belonged to one of the Coast Guard radio station guys. Everything yeah. they found, nothing has pointed to it. Nothing definitive. And if you believe in that piece of metal, yeah. then you can believe in it. I personally, and I, I don't know about you, Forrest, but yeah. I personally don't think it came from her plane. Okay. 
All right, so enter hypothesis number two. Now, hypothesis number two and number three actually have a fair amount of overlap, and it is my personal opinion that these two are more plausible than the first one we presented, although plenty of people think the first one is the answer. So just to be fair. So hypothesis number two is Elgin Long's hypothesis, which is more famously known as the crash and sink theory. And, And this one's a little bit simpler. So enter this guy, Elgin Long. This man holds 15 aviation records, mostly from one flight, the first flight around the world over both poles in 1971. He is also a former accident investigator for the Airline Pilots Association and a member of the International Society of Air Safety Investigators. Additionally, he's an expert in radio communications, navigation, and aircraft operational performance. He flew seaplanes in the Pacific Theater during World War II and was also a 747 pilot. He and his late wife have spent their entire retirement since 1987 researching and developing their own hypothesis on Amelia's disappearance. And newsflash, it's got nothing to do with Nico Mororo. In 2009, the movie Amelia with Hilary Swank and Richard Gere as G.P. Putnam was based on Elgin Long's research and theories. Hypotheses. <laughs> It's, yeah. hard. it's hard to do, <clears throat> isn't it? Mm. Um, Long's crash and sink theory is widely regarded as gospel by many. He is the expert that Rick Gillespie from Tiger, who we mentioned earlier, had asked to evaluate Artifact 2-2-V-1 back in 1991 when they found it, the piece of metal from the window. Long is also the one who discredited it as being a piece of her Lockheed Electra 10E, and he stated that he thought, apparently, that it was from a Catalina PBY, as we mentioned earlier, a fact that Gillespie just republished days ago and refuted. Long put forth his hypothesis as a statement of fact in his book, Amelia Earhart, The Mystery Solved. Again, everybody says the mystery solved. Oh, mm-hmm. We've solved it. Right. M- no, Elgin Long hasn't found the plane either, just for the record. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. Like, I, it bothers me a little bit how people are like, it's solved. It's, well, it's just, that's what sells It's not books, solved but... until I see the yeah. plane or Amelia Earhart's bones. I'm sorry. No disrespect to Amelia. But the, this is the important thing. Mr. Long's opinions and his research feature prominently in almost every theory because he is too well respected and experienced to be ignored. So let, let's go. Let's take a look yeah. at his theory. Now we're back in uh, Ley. We're in Papua New Guinea. And what happens after they take off? And this is the important thing to remember. He has uncovered facts relating to their takeoff that play into every theory because they're facts. Keep in mind that this is a worldwide feat. That people are paying attention to. So right. she's being monitored. Uh, people on Ley in Papua New Guinea are keeping track of her fuel. They, that's where they see Fred Noonan in the bar, and they say, like, well, he was drinking a lot. That's nah, right. Nah, nah. And, uh, you know, the bartender, you know, people are paying attention to this. It's like you said. You're right. It's, it's a big deal, and it has all the people around it that are supposed to be maintaining it. And the man who ran the airport, uh, the Papua New Guinea airport in New Guinea Airlines. Yeah, the airlines was, there. Yeah, yeah. His name was Eric Chater. And... Eric Chater had made a report of everything that happened while they were there and after they took off, and he actually submitted it after their disappearance. Yeah, he was still listening to her and communicating. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He's the only one that had two-way right, communication right. with her. And this report was lost until 1992. I be- uh, yeah, I believe Elgin Long found it in Vancouver right, somewhere. Right, exactly. Yeah. It went it went away, and, and Chater never brought it up again because apparently he died from an untimely uh, death from an accident or something. Or he probably would have been like, hey, what happened to my report? So yeah. in this report... You can see a lot of things. There's actually a chief engineer's report from Chief Engineer Finn about what they did to the plane the night before they took off here. And and I'm going to read some of this just so you can get a feel for, you know, the time, the period, and and what they were doing. Chief Engineer Finn's report. Clean set of spark plugs fitted to both engines. Oil drained from both tanks. Oil filters inspected and cleaned both engines. Petrol pump removed from starboard engine on account of fluctuation of pressure at cruising revolutions. Spare petrol pump fitted. Thermocouple connection on number four cylinder, starboard engine repaired. Air scoop between numbers two and three cylinders on port engine repaired. Propellers greased. Batteries inspected for level and charge. New cartridge fitted to exhaust gas analyzer, starboard side. So anyway, the, well, the that's list great goes service. On. Yeah, I would love to take my car there. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's not like uh, 
<laughs> these ten minute oil shops where they right. don't forget to put the drain plug back in. Oh uh, yeah. And and the last thing it says engines, instruments, and aircraft approved okay by Miss Earhart. Uh, by the way, engines. Uh, here's another interesting thing: engines run up on ground and tested in air. Both engines okay. Petrol pressure port. Engine four and a half pounds. Starboard engine four and three quarter pounds. So I mean, they checked everything yeah. out as you, you do know, as you like, do with any airplane right yeah yeah because you, you can't afford to really have no you just don't get in your car you know, start it and then go to the store yeah it's not like getting a flat tire you just pull over and get right. out there's additionally there's some communications here about their interaction with him around the airport including some transcripts of communications between the atasca and the airport here's a message that Earhart sent to the Atasca, plan midday takeoff here please have meteorologists send forecast lay howland as soon as possible if reaches me in time, we'll try to leave today. Otherwise, July 1st. Report in English, not code. Remember? They didn't know Morse mm, code. All right. Especially while flying. Stop. We'll broadcast hourly quarter past hour GCT further information later. By the way, the GCT is a reference to the time base that they're going to be using. Greenwich. And the, right. uh, yeah, but it's it's not the... Um, <laughs> I know I know it is Greenwich mean time now, it's, but that back then it was yeah, called it was the Greenwich... Yeah, it GCT uh, time, cor- exactly. Cor- Greenwich coordinated time. That's I right, yeah. as opposed to zone time, which they think the Atasca was using. Right. Which would further generate navigational I, You know what? I believe they it put them at a difference of 30 minutes apart. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Additionally... Our wireless operator reports, the condition of radio equipment of Earhart's plane is as follows. Transmitter carrier wave on 6210 KC was very rough, and I advised Miss Earhart to pitch her voice higher to overcome distortion caused by rough carrier wave. Mm. Otherwise, transmitter seemed to be working satisfactorily. Additionally, Mr. Chater noted, Miss Earhart and Captain Noonan spent a considerable time in the radio office, and as previously mentioned, it was learned that neither of them could read Morse at any speed but could only distinguish letters made individually, slowly, and repeated often. In that case, their direction-finding apparatus would be useless or misleading unless they were taking a bearing on a station using radio phone, which could give the station position on voice. We understand the Atasca was to do this, but if the plane was unable to pick up the Atasca, it is doubtful if the direction finder would be any use to her. So these are all notes from the Chater Report. This thing was a goldmine for long. It's like, Oh, oh, there's so much useful information here. He claims that that's that is his smoking gun. Yeah, that yeah. he's saying. Well, the main point of this report is that you know it it helped him paint a picture of how what conditions they were taking off under. So because the next thing that the other thing that the Chater report confirmed was that bad weather was coming in, as you mentioned in part one of the show. Yeah. About the reason that they didn't take off, which you know, some said weather and technicality, and we're also going to yeah. say maybe Fred Noonan's hangover. Well, <laughs> but, hey, you know, maybe. Listen, well, our opinion. no, no. Well, this is, yeah, but you know, that's the thing. He was seen drinking, right? And people—that's what people reported the night before because they had had an argument. She had reported back to Putnam that uh, she was having personnel problems, quote it, unquote. That's right. By so, telex, yes, yes, by telex, and yeah. uh, you know, so obviously it's a known thing that you know. Look, you're spending a lot of time in a tiny compartment with somebody, so nerves are fraying. But this is the thing: in that part of the world, storms come up very quickly. Right. And uh, and it also factors into what you'd mentioned earlier, the Swiss cheese theory, that, yes, the, that problems are compounding. And I just, uh, before I came over here, I was actually reading an article on dead reckoning. Oh, yes. And that if you're off by a little, it starts to compound. Yes. Because, again, it's like if you uh, if you ever get your, uh, your GPS and your, your map app here, Apple Maps or Waze or something, and you notice that if you keep it at a steady speed, the, your destination time changes. But it's, it's incremental, and it, and it plays over a, at a greater factor over a longer distance. That's right. So, Compounds. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so the, all I was going to say is that this will factor into how much fuel she burns up later on. That's right. So, yeah, and, so, and that gets to the point. The, that, that stuff is very interesting in the Chater Report, but the more interesting part is the documentation of the transmissions that – they shared between each other because, again, this was the only two-way transmission that she had after they took off from Lay. So her after she took off, her first transmission to Chater was four hours and 18 minutes into the flight, and she reported her status and everything was good, and she, she said her trademark famous phrase, everything okay. Forty-five minutes later, Amelia encountered bad storm clouds that were too dangerous to fly through. And by the way, there were notes in the Chater report earlier, which I didn't include here, uh, that that stated to her, which I'm sure they already knew this, but like yeah. if you see cumulus clouds, you do not – don't fly into them. They're dangerous. The sure. centers are dangerous. Yeah. So they're five hours in now, and she's talking about these storm clouds, and she has to divert a little bit. So she has to go over the mountain island of Bougainville um, 
or I don't Bougainville. know. Bougainville. Bougainville. Yeah, okay, Bougainville. Sorry, I, I think that's French our... on it because like the plant. <laughs> Bougainville. Well, anyway, yeah, Bougainville. It's in the so- but, it's in the North Solomons, although right. technically it's part of Papua New Guinea. Right. But yeah. I think there's there's high mountains, not really high, but yeah. there's mountains there. High and enough. High enough that then now she, she has, has to, climb. to climb them. Right. So, and this is the thing, when, when uh, her calculations were made, and these are the, the two things that I know about this, that she uh, made a calculation, there's a certain altitude, which is a, the optimum cruising optimum altitude, cruising altitude right. and there's an optimum cruising speed to conserve and optimize your Get fuel. Get your best mileage. Get it's your just best like mi- all you guys exactly. out there with your electric cars, you look yeah. down at that little needle it, that tells you As you know, is. if you're doing eight, eight, you know, 80 to 90 miles an hour, you are... You're, you're, you're burning a lot more fuel. Right. So this is the thing. I, I do remember that she was she had planned her calculations at having a 12-mile-an-hour headwind. That's right. Now she was getting uh, 25 miles per hour headwinds. Yes. So that's that's burning that up. She had to climb, gun the engines to climb out of the, to get above the storm right. and the mountains. Right. Addition, and, and not only is she gunning the engine, she's carrying all that extra weight of all that fuel. It's I very mean, heavy. Barely, yeah. if you might remember from part one, and again, Forrest says some people won't listen to part one, but <laughs> when, she, when they took off in New Guinea, they barely got up in the air. They flew over the water on ground effect for yeah. a long ways before they managed to rotate yeah. up. That's the, the cushion of air kind of uh, proper. Between the earth and the plane. Yeah, Yeah, which it's like if you slow down even just a little, you're going to crash. Yeah, they were lucky. Because they were so heavy. They they were carrying huge fuel tanks. And you can see in that one picture of her from the back of the plane, she's at the radio station. You actually can't even walk from the front to the back because of all the fuel tanks. Oh, that's right. That's why you see them kind of crawling in from the uh, the cockpit from the top. And that's a note to Ryan, by the way, because when when we talked about her going to the bathroom, he has her walking down the middle there. (laughs) Oh, really? A little technical Uh, sound effect error. I was just a. I don't think. See, anything, more like gonna... crawling over the gas tanks, uh, I guess. No one's going to hold us diarrhea and vomiting. Oh, oh. why do you... And they see, well, now, he's... Now, now he's going to put that sound effect no, in. No, 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 we're going to leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so they had to climb over the island to deal with the storms. And then, as Forrest said, once, as soon as they got over that island, they're at this new uh, elevation... And in addition to that, they're facing a headwind that's over twice what they calculated fuel consumption for. Right. So she's already burned up a, a good amount of fuel. Extra now, fuel, right. Because yeah. And this lends credence to the whole thing. It's like, why would they ditch or disappear when theoretically they had two hours of fuel left? Yeah. Now, and with the headwind and her having to uh, throttle up to yeah. maintain the right speed and, and, and course and everything— they were burning uh, an extra 10% an hour. It's a lot of fuel is gone. Well, imagine yeah. this. And this, the, it, by the time she gets to the, the destination, to near the Itasca, right. she's been up flying 18 hours. She's exhausted. Th- yeah. These are all these factors that we're trying to ex- express right. here that, that play into this. Right. And so Long's point of view as a researcher is like, okay, they got the headwind. They had to climb over the island. We now know this from the Chater report. And the last thing she reported after climbing over the island, that was the last time she said everything okay. And so now, 10 hours into the flight, they are supposed to be taking a sighting on a ship that is halfway between Ley and Howland Island. Yeah, the USS destiny. Ontario. Yes, right. the USS Ontario, which was parked specifically to provide a sighting for them, which, you know, a sighting or yeah. a fix, which is critical in dead reckoning. You yeah. have to have your fixes. And Yeah, keep in mind, this is all visual. This is yeah. looking out the window. Yeah, we're looking out the window navigation. Yeah. And so they flew over there. But what Mr. Long believes is that they might have not sighted the right ship because 40 miles north of the Ontario was the USS Myrtle Bank. Right. And they he thinks and again this is theory this yeah. is or excuse me this is hypothesis this is there's no way to know if they saw the Myrtle Bank or the Ontario. Right. Right. But it's their belief that the reason they were out of position was because they saw the Myrtle Bank and their yeah. course deviated by enough degrees that by the time they got to where Howland Island was supposed yeah. to be they were way north of it. Well, this figures into dead reckoning because you need a fixed spot of, exactly. of a known object. And Fred Noonan was an expert in dead reckoning. Right. So if he fixed his course, the line now, you got to figure, is, is way off. And again, like we were talking about before, things compounding. Yes. So you, yeah, maybe it's only 40 miles, but by the time you add another, uh, you know, few hundred miles or a thousand miles at, at the end of that, you're going to be way off. Well, they had a thousand left to go. Yeah. So if they saw the Myrtle Bank instead of the Ontario with a thousand miles left and they were 40 miles out of position, yeah. they're in deep dookie. You're going to be way off by the right. time you get there. So, right. yeah. So, or as my dad says, they were in deep yogurt. <laughs> but um, anyway, so moving away from what we learned in the Chater Report, we now move on to the other evidence that Mr. Long has recovered from the accounts of Chief Leo Bellarts on yeah. the Itasca. He was the radio man on the Itasca. Now, again, 
the Elgin Long crash and sink theory doesn't own Bell Arts. The Bell Arts communications are fact. Yeah. And they should theoretically work with the Nicomororo theory and also the third, excuse me, hypothesis, and also the third hypothesis that we're going to put tonight. Right. Bell Arts information is fact. Yes. It doesn't belong to the Long theory, but we're going to cover it here because they, it features prominently in their deductions right. about what happened in the crash and sink. Bell Arts was set up, he was supposed to be communicating with them two ways. This, there are tons of pages of documents. There's all kinds of analysis. You can find it about why these conversations didn't work out. But the long and short of it is this. Bell Arts and Amelia Earhart, the Atasca and Amelia Earhart, never exchanged a two-way conversation. That's really an interesting fact. Yeah. yeah. Bell Arts could hear her. They, they, he heard her. Right. There's no way to know if she heard them. She never responded to anything that he said. No, that's what's kind of strange is that you think, you know, look, I think at this point she's probably getting nervous. Yeah. And, and yeah. we already know that they suck at radio operation. Yeah. Well, right? they, and, and, like <laughs> supposedly they broke the antenna off on takeoff. They're, you know, that's what some people Oh, right, right. Well, they clipped, having, they clipped one. Uh, the belly antenna and yeah. or it was the wrong length. There's all these things. It's like if the stars weren't aligned just right, they weren't going to be able to communicate. They don't know Morse code. They don't have their Morse code equipment anyway. They, right. They specifically requested it was in some the chair fa- report. Yeah. No Morse code yeah. communication. Communication, although Bell Arts sent it, because we don't know if the Atasca ever received that request. Oh, going back, that was the original communication plan drawn up by the guy who didn't make uh, it. Manning. The, yeah. By Captain Manning, who was the original navigator who decided not to do the trip after she crashed on takeoff in Hawaii the right. first time when they were going to go the other way around the world. Well, nobody told the radio crew of the Atasca because that's the plan that they were still going with. Right. They were yeah. going with a sophisticated plan that was like 90% Morse code. And the problem was that plan was drawn up by a gentleman who was no longer on the mission. Right. And no, and again, nobody on the flight, nobody changed it or, or updated it or told the, the uh, ship's radio operator. Right. So hypothetically, we have a hungover navigator in this plane that is overloaded. It's burned a bunch of fuel. It's flying into a headwind. It, they may have sighted the wrong ship. They're out of position. The radio plan isn't working. The, yeah, and they're right? just plain not getting, no pun intended, yeah. they're just plain not getting where they're supposed to be going yeah. with Hallen Island. So they get to a point where they're they're supposed to be close to it, and sort of their final transmission is that they're, they've now been flying for 18 hours, right? And in theory, they at their normal elevation, they would be able to see for 100 miles and sight Howland Island, but the yeah. problem was the final sort of piece of Swiss cheese that was out of alignment or the in the error chain was that there was low cloud cover. So that forced them to descend to 1,000 feet. At 1,000 feet, you can only see about 20 miles to the horizon. So they're having an additional problem sighting Howland Island, which is 15 feet above sea level, and they, they can't see it. They're now flying at this low altitude, and they're frantically radioing the Itasca asking for help. At one point, she even says, I'm going to whistle. I'll make a sound into the into the uh, right, if he could, if he could hear a constant tone from her, he might be able to tri- triangulate right. Her position. Right, and she yeah. whistled into the radio uh, again, doing the higher pitch thing because she had been instructed that she had a bad carrier and that, that this would help it come through. Well, it didn't work though. She, you know, and they heard it. Yeah. And at one point, Bell Arts said that their transmissions were coming in so clearly. He right. stepped outside of the radio room. He expected to see them on the horizon. <laughs> Yeah, he cocked his head because he thought like he could probably hear what direction they were coming from. Right, he thought he would hear the plane. And he was he was rating these uh, signals on a scale of one to five, uh, five being the clearest. And I yes. think it, it goes back to the old saying, uh, coming in five by five. Yes, you know, right. yes, which is a CB. Yeah, there uh, you go. CB term as well. All right, good buddy. Yeah. So th- the last thing she said is, "We are on the line one five seven three three seven. We will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilocycles, which was the uh, other frequency that she would broadcast. She was mostly at 3105 uh, kilocycles. However, a few minutes later, she came back on the radio with uh, some kind of transmission that was logged as questionable. And she said, we are running online north and south. And it, it seemed to indicate that she and Noonan thought that they had really ha, that they had reached Howland's charted position, which would lend credence to the theory that they maybe sighted the Myrtle Bank instead of the instead of the Ontario, because they thought they were in the right place and it wasn't there. The Itasca at one point had even used her oil fired boilers to generate black smoke so yes. that they could find it. So th- there was all this stuff going on, but there were scattered clouds everywhere, and it sh- you know they're only at a thousand feet. They don't know what's happening and. And the last voice transmission that was received from Earhart indicated that, that she and Noonan were flying along a line of position, taking from a sun line, running on 157, 337 degrees, 
which Noonan would have calculated and drawn on a chart as passing through Halland. Now, the, the thing about this is that Bellart said uh, during this last transmission, which they said they were going to repeat and they never repeated, at, right at the end of it, he heard the engine sputtering. Oh, that, see, that's interesting. Yeah. So he clearly heard that sputtering from he running out of fuel. He heard the engine sputter, and okay. that was the last transmission they heard. So Long feels that since she was nearly out of gas, and based on the last position she successfully said they were at, then there's no way they could have made it to any other land. There's no way. Mm. It rules out getting to Nico Mororo because he knows he's now taking the Chater report into account that they yeah. had to climb over the island to go around the storms and the headwind and all that. Even if he's wrong, there's no way she got to Nico Mororo. Yeah. So, following this theory, they're saying the plane ditched short of the island. Yeah. Long assembled a group of people from a defense contractor named Rockwell Collins to... Did he did he call these guys together? Or well, did, you uh... know, it's never been made clear, but I, okay. I, I feel like they either came to him or he went to them and they it's, were like, uh... let's, let's help you out. Let's figure this out. Because yeah, they wanted Tom, to take... Tom Vinson. Right. And uh, I believe he's... Yeah, all these guys are doing this in their spare time. Yes. But, but a lot but of they our... also have access to Rockwell Collins, like yeah. supercomputers. But these and... guys are... They, these guys build their own radios. That's yeah. how smart these they are. These are hardcore. They're yeah. like ham radio guys in their free time or whatever. Here, here's what Rockwell Collins' website says. Rockwell Collins is a pioneer in the design, production, and support of innovative solutions for our customers in aerospace and defense. Our expertise in flight deck avionics, cabin electronics, mission communications, information management, and simulation and training is strengthened by our global service and support network spanning 27 countries. So you can see what the kind of stuff they're into. Yeah. These guys come together. They decide they're going to take Bell Arts radio log where he carefully wrote down the signal strength of each signal from each transmission. And so they sort of do a re reverse forensic analysis where they take all these signals, they analyze them, and they come up with a theory about a general area where she probably was when they had to ditch. Yeah, they have a, uh, a program, I believe, they called RENAV. Well, uh, RENAV, that's another company, oh. RENAV. RENAV is not a COS. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, the, okay. so what's happening here is they put all this stuff together. Then they took all that information and all the other information they had from Chater and all that, and they handed that over to a company called Nauticos that has the software that Forrest is talking about. Oh, right. right. Yeah, they're a deep sea recovery uh, yes. company. Yeah. yeah, deep sea recovery company. And these guys are good. So the, and they their program, Renav, they plug in everything. Uh, it's I like, see. Yeah. how much fuel did they have? They had to do the climb over Bougainville, the headwind, when they took off, you know, how much throttling were they doing? Yeah. Then they take the radio signals. They feed all this stuff in, and they basically spit out a piece of yeah. ocean that they think the plane's in. It's not right. unlike, you know, the patches you see for MH370, that flight that's missing, when yeah, they say, oh, it has to be here. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that Renav does. Yeah, if but you but you need some data at the tail end of that to 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 leap off from right. To well, yeah, you know. and they come up with an area, and they came up with this area that's not tiny but small enough to search. Yeah, they won't say exactly where, of course. No, they because won't. It's, it's proprietary. But it's but... Um, sixteen thousand feet deep. Right, for, and about four hundred miles. Am I uh, correct me if I'm wrong here? Four hundred miles northeast. Yes, of how Howland? Howland? Yeah, okay. something like that. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, no, distance, no. I, but, yeah. So they plug all this stuff in, and they decide that they're going to go look for it, right? Right. This is the thing about all this information that I can tell you right now about Nauticos and Elgin Long and the theory and all that. All of this information that we're sharing with you right now is 12 years old. Yeah. Okay? They went, and they searched this area. Yeah. And if you go to their very own website, to Nauticos' website— they went looking for the plane in an area in March and April of 2006, and then on the website it said they were planning to go back in 2010. There have been no updates since that. Ah, That's the last thing okay. on the webpage, All right? right. So they they either have given up or they haven't raised the money or they haven't got the whatever to go back. Yeah. But with all of this stuff that we're giving you and Mr. Long's theory and yeah. how far they've gone with the supercomputers and crunching the data and all yeah. that, they have not found the plane. Yeah. I want to quantify that by saying that Nauticos – is a serious company. And yeah, they've actually like had a pretty good their, track record. Yeah, their track record things. is great. One of their most famous recoveries or, or findings, I should say, is that they found the Israeli submarine, the Dakar, which oh, um, oh. which uh, Israel couldn't find for 28 years. And yeah. you know Israel, they, so like, they can find anything. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they know what color my shirt is. So like, yeah. apparently this uh, submarine, the newly commissioned Dakar, was three months old when it vanished on January 25th, 1968, without a trace. Wow. And they looked for it for 28 years. 
Israel then hired Nauticos, and Nauticos found it in four years. No, <laughs> really? Yeah, wow, four years. Impressive. And, yeah. Uh, and it was eventually recovered, and they still don't know why she sank. My point is that Nauticos knows what it's doing, which, Scott, Scott, which means yeah. Long's hypothesis yeah. is still just a hypothesis. Right. Right. But think of this. Uh, uh, you know, of course, people uh, here currently are going to th- make comparisons to MH370. Yeah. And think about that. That's not a, that's not Amelia Earhart in 1937. Right. This just happened right. with one of the most high-tech aircraft that's out there, and they still can't find it. That's right. So it's not. it's a very difficult thing, even with a lot of data. Well, that's the thing. They're, they're missing some data. But, you know, this is a uh, the needle in a haystack of needles. Okay. Yeah. So nothing against them. It's, no. it's an extremely difficult thing to do yes. based on uh, 70-year-old data. That's right. Right. That's sort of the end of that theory. And I have tremendous respect for his theory. And a lot of people think that it's the Occam's razor theory. This is the simple one. Yeah. They, they were flying. They, they had a chain of errors that contributed to them running out of gas, right. short of the island. They were out of position a little bit. He was running a ladder, a ladder pattern, yeah, they, meaning he they was going did, back and forth. They right? did determine that Noonan had put the plane into a ladder pattern, which is what you do when you're trying to find land. You're not exactly yeah. sure where you are. You're trying to find land. And, and they also determined that on the last tack that they were on, had they continued straight, they would have hit Howard Island. Yeah, ironically. And that's all if you buy this. I mean, hey, maybe they're on Nicomororo. That brings us to hypothesis number three. Yes, and this one doesn't have so much to do with navigation and science, shall we say, technical aspects of this. It's it's really more about human nature, and I think it takes it in a whole other direction. But if you go down this route, I think it does solve some mysteries. I agree. Okay. We don't have to remember that she, she was a celebrity, and she was actually pretty good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes, they were both pioneering women who believed in a lot of the same causes. That's right. So it's it's not hard to imagine that her and G.P. Putnam as well, her husband and publisher, were connected to the White House at this time. And he, I believe he was friends with FDR. Exactly. So they, they're both... They're cozy. Yeah, they all the people. It's like the people do now. They they run in certain circles and uh, celebrities, politicians. Yes. Same same as it ever was. At this time, there was a fair amount of tension in the Pacific between Japan and the United States. Yeah, war had not broken out yet, but you know what? They knew it was coming. Right. Uh, they had a sinking suspicion that Japan was militarizing some of these small islands, and there can only be one reason for that is that they are stepping stones to the North American continent. Yeah, so what do you do if, if you have to worry about an attack in the Pacific and you haven't surveyed the islands in the Pacific since the 1800s? Yeah. What, you know, what might be a good way to get some coverage of that? See what's going on and confirm your suspicions and furthermore, get some proof that you can put to the League of Nations and saying, hey, this is going on. Take a look at what they're doing right. rather than, you know, just having them deny that. So maybe you come to uh, somebody who's a world famous aviatrix and you say, hey, you know what? We want you to fly around the world. Again, we're going to remind you from part one, there were no more records for her to break. There was nothing else to do. And one of the things that was pitched was, oh, this was GP. He wanted to come up with a way to capitalize. They needed some more income and that sort of thing. But maybe that wasn't what happened at all. Maybe FDR went to them and said, we want you to fly over these islands and take pictures yeah. with cameras in your airplane. And no one's going to mess with you because you're the world famous aviatrix, Amelia Earhart. And we can get some really useful information. It's very important to the survival of the country. Or they might have also said, some people have posited, we want you to go over there and we want you to ditch. We're going to set up a little island for you with some rations and some food, and you're going to go down. And after you go down, we're going to use it as an excuse to mobilize the entire Pacific fleet. Well, that's starting to sound like a Hollywood movie, Scott. It does sound a little like a movie, doesn't it? From 1943? What movie would that be? Well, that would be uh, Flight for Freedom. Rosalind Russell and Fred McMurray. My favorite, Fred (laughs) McMurray. He's a... It's My Three Sons. Yeah, My Three Sons Everybody's famous uh, favorite dad. Yes, and also um, my favorite Double Indemnity. Double Indemnity and the Cane Mutiny. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, he's got quite a range. There are some interesting, I don't want to say coincidences, but some connections, at least, between this movie, which I actually just found today before we started recording here. It's, in in the, the, uh, it's featured, uh, sorry to interrupt, it's large segments of it are featured in the In Search Of that we have oh, that's, on our website yes. if you want to see just pieces of it. 
Okay, so in 1943, this movie Flight for Freedom comes out, and as we said, it's got Rosalind Russell and Fred McMurray kind of playing Amelia Earhart and a Fred Noonan-type character. Fred McMurray is basically a, a rival pilot who ends up falling for her, and the story was going to be the, uh, towards the end of the journey, was going to join her on one of these islands and help her, you know, get home. There'll be a widespread search for you. Public opinion will demand it. That search will include the Japanese-mandated islands. And Japan won't dare to interfere because we are looking for you, the world's greatest woman flyer. During that search, we'll photograph every square mile of those islands. Then, when war comes, we'll be able to defend ourselves against attack and strike back at the nerve centers of their empire. So that's the premise of the movie. But, of course, what happens in the movie is that she gets close. She finds out the Japanese already know about this plan and that they're, you know, she's going to get captured. They're going to find out. They're not going to like it. Uh, Fred McMurray is supposed to join her on one of these islands, and they're, of course they're going to they're going to get him. He's going to be in trouble. So she does the heroic and brave thing and ditches the plane into the ocean, never to be found again. Wow. Now the interesting connections here, Scott. Yes. Is that uh, Flight for Freedom was produced by RKO, and the CEO at the time was Floyd Odlum. I believe I'm saying that name correctly, and he was married to. Jacqueline Cochran, and she was a very close friend of Amelia Earhart and also a pilot. So there's a bigger connection rather than them just thinking like, here's a way to turn a quick buck. With a well, didn't you say that there was a rumor that Putnam drafted the script? That is something I read in the, in the, off the Wikipedia page. Putnam is that, would be, just to refresh your memories, yeah. and also if you hadn't heard part one, he was Amelia's husband who she supposedly sort of reluctantly married because she was... Right. You know, she told him it was basically just a, a partnership, an right. equal partnership. Although his uh, his stepchildren and her, or her stepchildren to this day say that they had a loving relationship behind the scenes, but Putnam was a publisher who had made a fortune publishing books about Lindbergh. Okay, so the interesting thing about Flight for Freedom and uh, being produced by Floyd Odlum as the CEO of RKO Pictures is that it's kind of putting forth a theory about what happened to her. And not so much the ending, because, of course, nobody knows the ending. They're supposing that. But the reason for the flight is that it's a top-secret spy mission that she's on. Exactly. Lady uh, lady spy of the skies. It's pretty cool. Uh, well, look, they're, they're dramatizing it, of course, for, for, a mo- for movie purposes. Yeah. But it's not too far afield from one of the theories that we're going to get to. During our research, we came across a fascinating documentary called Earhart's Electra by a filmmaker named Richard Martini. This movie is currently available on Amazon for just $2 to watch streaming or $14.99 to own, and there's a link to it on our website. But I got to tell you, I found myself slack-jawed while watching it. The witness interviews featured in it are game changers, including a series of interviews with local Saipanese that TC buddy Brennan III did in the 80s and would be lost to time without him because most of the witnesses have passed away. You guys should also visit EarhartOnSaipan.com. It's an affiliated site of Martini's in collaboration with explorer Mike Harris Sr., which has a fascinating update that was just posted to it four days before we posted this episode. And before we move on, I also want to cite author Mike Campbell's website, EarhartTruth.wordpress.com, as well as his book, Truth at Last, which we have a link to on our website if you'd like to purchase it. Mr. Campbell's site is another great repository of fascinating information related to the case, including his highlighting of celestial navigator, former airline pilot, and member of the Amelia Earhart Society, Gary LaPook's observations about the stamping seen on Tiger's aluminum artifact. All right, so getting back to Richard Martini's documentary regarding the idea that Earhart was captured by the Japanese and taken, her and Noonan were both taken and held prisoner on the island of Saipan, where they were interrogated for several years. This theory seems like, when I first started doing this research, this theory to me sounded the most far out. And I was like, did it? Yeah, I was just like, that's wacky. You know, and the whole spy thing, it's like, oh, that's cloak and dagger. That's just the movies or whatever. Yeah. And then like held prisoner and eventually executed. That's what the rumor was on Saipan. I was just like, this seems crazy, you know, but then once we started digging into this and I started looking and it's not just the information isn't just coming from Martini's documentary. It's, it's been around for a while. In fact, uh, it was a uh, Fred Gurner, right? Yes. In 1966, a reporter for CBS news out of San Francisco, Fred Gurner, 
I got a hold of some information. I don't know how it initially came to him. Yeah, he did like he had been doing like sixteen years of research or something. Well, yeah, yeah. Did around that, yeah. and then uh, I think be, be, between the time that he had first gathered this information and was doing interviews to writing the book it was about four years. So maybe four years prior to that. But he was he started to get gather, you know, as a newsman does, started to gather more leads and uh, interviewing people. And then finally, oh, I'm just saying, in on in search of, he said he'd been oh. researching it for 16 years. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm sh- yeah, but yeah. I'm sure by the time they interviewed him, yeah. years later, not yes. not in '66, right, 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 of course that right. uh, that he'd been doing. Oh it. right, you're saying that oh, right. he'd been doing it for years. His, wrote yeah. the book and then kept working. Right. right, but something intrigued him because he was getting these reports. And, and look, what we're going to get at here is that this is nothing new. Yeah, that people knew about this. Yeah, and this is what fasc- It's fascinating to me because this again accounts for human nature and. What's the bias again, Scott? Confirmation bias. That once you've done and spent a lot of money and you've you've done all this research and you've put your life into it, you don't want to say at the end of that, like, ooh, maybe I'm this wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Eh, you know what? Let's just start all over again. Right. I, you don't have another 16 years to do that. So here is kind of the overall end story for hypothesis number three. Earhart and Noonan are, yes, they're running out of gas. They can't find Howland Island. But guess what? They get shot down by the Japanese. Right. And, but not killed, and both Earhart and Noonan are captured and taken to Saipan, which was one of the islands. Not Again, not, not really that near, but now you're starting to head, I believe, west. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And to back this up, there's over 200 witnesses. Right. But th- but that's the general idea, right? So, so Yeah, I mean, and, but not only, not only that, they may have not been lost. They may have also not been out of gas. Right. They may have been on a mission. Oh, yeah. That, that you know, in theory, FDR put them up to. Well, and then there's another bent that they may have known about it or may not have. Right. Uh, I believe that there was, and maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I believe there was a testimony from a Navy airplane mechanic That's who right. said that he put two spy cameras on the plane. That's right. He clearly stated that over, over the course of multiple interviews, several years apart. He later right. became a, uh, a highway patrolman. I can't remember. I think yeah, in yeah. California yeah, you're right. or something. Yeah, right. He it came he back was, to him 20 years later. Yeah. yeah, and they were like, no, he's, yep, I put two cameras in the belly yeah. of that plane. Two of the most sophisticated cameras that were available at the time. Now, let's see, because that explains a lot, to me anyway, because you're yes. thinking, well, first of all, look, the Japanese, they got a big plan that they're not really telling the world now. Yes. Uh, they know what they're doing, as yeah. well as the Germans. So they're really touchy. They're really edgy. They realize that they're, uh, they're not playing fair here, and uh, they are monitoring any incursions very closely. So here they see this plane... And uh, the idea, though, is that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange plane. I, maybe she can't communicate with them. They're not getting valid communication. Better to be safe than sorry. Shoot them down. Well, they, they're not killed, but they are taken captive. Yes. Okay. And yeah, the rumor is that they landed relatively intact on the Millie Atoll. Right. Even the, the plane was recovered. Yeah, the plane and, was and recovered. And moved on barge. On a barge back to Saipan, right. along with them as prisoners. Yes. Although they bounced around a couple of islands before they made it to Saipan, I'm pretty sure. Which yeah, these are not Saipan's not close by. No, these are yeah. these are pretty big distances. Yeah. But they're accessible. And yeah. so uh there's there's normal commerce and supplies being routed to all these little islands. And the Japanese what they're doing is they're taking control of this because these are stepping stones for plane flights exactly. to get to North America. Right. And coming back to the whole thing which we said earlier, were they on a spy mission? Did FDR ask them to ditch? So they could map the South yeah. Pacific. I mean, it's a well. Look, you're you're already there. So yeah. you know what I'm saying. So yeah. a military plane in the area. Well, that'd be very. Yeah, that's going to get shot down. Yeah. Uh, but here, here's maybe a great opportunity to take some photos of uh, the truck atoll. That's one. That's one theory. They knew that the Japanese were moving in a lot of gear, a lot of weapons, right. a lot of ships, a lot of ship activity around there. So anyway. So and, and there was also a rumor that wasn't there a rumor that somebody in FDR's cabinet was overheard on the phone saying yeah, she disobeyed I, every order we gave her or something right. to that effect. Yes. So I mean, what is that about? You know, it, was she up to something, or maybe she didn't know the cameras were on the plane? Maybe only Noonan knew. Maybe Noonan right. didn't know. Maybe I mean, someone has to take the pictures, I guess. Well, but, that's the thing. It's it, I know. And also, yeah. look at where the fuel tanks were. Yeah. When you think about it in those pictures. The fuel tanks would perfectly hide a camera in the in the belly of the fuel sludge. Right. 
It would be right on top of it. This is the thing. We don't know these things. So the plane is lost. Whatever it is, it's unrecoverable at this moment in time. Yeah. So we're not going to know. But there's people who testified that this happened. And so, and again, it goes to the point where, like, if the Japanese, if they, even if they shoot the plane down, just, just out of precaution, then they find this camera, well, that's not going to go over so well. No. That kind of supports the theory of why she was held captive for so many years. Okay, so now we're talking about 1937. Move forward to the time of the United States Marines and the, and the U.S. Navy liberating the island of Saipan. So now we're talking June 1944. And it was a really awful battle. About They, were, they thought about 60,000 Japanese soldiers were defending the island. So the first wave of Marines didn't even make it to the beach. So, but the second wave, they were able to penetrate. The, the Navy's firing over their heads. Uh, it was a really nasty battle. They land at the southeastern part of the island. And they're making their way towards Garapan, which is the, the, the biggest city on there. So they're pushing the Japanese back along with the villagers, and they're, they're making their march up to the north part of the island. Well, so now we get there, and I think this is about 18 days after, they first, after the first battle. Now in this documentary, there's a couple of interviews with a couple of the, uh, the soldiers there, two Marines and, and one soldier from the Army, who have some very interesting stories. And, and the first guy they interview is uh, Julius Neighbors. He was a U.S. Marine who went in uh, with the invasion, and he was a code clerk, meaning that it's his job to decode messages sent over the radio, right. punch it into his machine, because they don't know who's listening. So one night, all the communications platoon, they, they kind of go back to the bivouac base, and he's just there with the commanding officer, Colonel Wallace, and one radio guy. So it's really just the three of them. This message comes over the radio, Neighbors decodes it, and it says they had found Amelia Earhart's airplane in a hangar at Aslito Airfield. On Saipan. On Saipan. Well, now that's big news. Because keep in mind, this is pretty fresh for these guys. That only happened in 1937. This is 1944. So they all knew with a story, and at, at this point in time... The, the theory is that she crashed in the ocean, ran right. out of fuel. It's been seven years since she disappeared. It's been seven years. Yeah. That's, the, that's the accepted theory. Right. They don't know where she is, but she's lost. She's no longer alive. So you, let me gone. get this straight. You're yeah. telling me that the radio man, he's received a message where they're saying, Amelia Earhart's plane is over here on the airfield in a hangar. Yes. He is, as Lido Airfield is towards the north of the island. Right. It's, it's near uh, Garapan, I believe. Right. Uh, and I might be wrong about that. But how do we know that it's a, her Electrotini? Well, we're going to get to that. Okay. I do know this. I know yeah. this. There were only, I think, 149 Electras built. Uh, there were 10 yeah, Bs and 10 whatever. Right. But the Es and the Bs looked very similar. But yeah, so there's not a lot of them. Well, there ain't a lot in Saipan. There's, yeah, there yeah. shouldn't be any in There Saipan. shouldn't be. This is a civilian aircraft. Right. Made in America. Right. Flown by Americans. Right. She's taken it where most... Nobody else has taken it. Right. Probably, I, I would guess, no further than Hawaii. Okay, so now we're a lot further away from there. So it's an unusual sight. It's like her and Fred Noonan being there themselves. There's, right, not, so there, there's not a lot of white people there. All right, so where are you? Okay, you're going to go on to another witness now? Yeah. Okay. But it's just quickly, though. Yeah, no yeah. one has found Earhart or Noonan, but they found the plane. Well, let me, let me finish. Okay. 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 It was Julius Neighbors' job to decode messages. So it's not really intercepted. It wasn't a secret thing. This is a message to Colonel Wallace right. coming directly to him. It was his job to just kind of decode it. And that's the message. They found her airplane. Right. Okay. Now these guys, look, these guys are in the Navy. They're the military. They know airplanes. It's not like, I don't know, it's got two propellers. Who knows? Right. Yeah. They know what it is. That's the message that comes through. So these two guys, neighbors and the radio man and Colonel Wallace get in a Jeep. They drive to the hangar right away. And when they get there, there is a Marine sergeant that says they need one more man to guard this hangar that her plane is in. And it wasn't just any plane. He says, we need to guard the hangar that Amelia Earhart's plane is in. Okay, so now this is the thing. I don't believe he saw it because there's, there's padlocks in the door. He said it was locked up. But, but it was kind of known, like, no, no, her plane's in there. Right. So from 10 p.m. to, like, around noon the next day, I mean, he'd been up all night. You know, and, and mind you, these guys are just, they, they hadn't We're bathed. talking about neighbors. Yes, we're yeah. talking about neighbors specifically. He's guarding the hangar that the airplane is supposed to be in. It's no secret. They won't show it to him, of course, and he's not peeking in. But it's kind of known, like, yep, that's her plane. It's in there. Just keep a guard on it. Okay, so eventually people come by and they want to see it. And he doesn't let them in. 
Okay, so now we go to another interview, and this is with uh, Robert E. Wallach. And he is with the second wave that came in and made it, 1st Battalion, 29th Marines. I love Mr. Okay. Wallach. Oh, yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, a great character here. He's bivouacked in Garapan. So that's where they, they set up camp. They're, it's the largest village on the island of Saipan. And they're, in the, they're kind of a camping around the ruins of a Catholic church there. So, they're right next door to it. Yeah, yeah, they're right next yeah, door. Yeah. So, and and of course, you know, the Americans they they bomb the airfield, so it's a it's a mess. Right. But there's buildings that are still standing there, and of course, in an airfield, there's offices there. So, you know, once this has happened, there's a lot of time for these guys to kind of kind of poke around. So he goes into this office near the airfield, which is obviously op- occupied by Japanese officers, and he finds a safe. And of course, he, I love in the interview he says, "Well, look, I think I've, I think uh, I'm going to be a rich marine here." Right. So he thinks he's found a bunch of money in the safe. So he, right, when he, they had an explosives expert. Well, he had a buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, some guy there is going to know something about explosives. He right. blows the doors off this safe. And now, you know, he was a little disappointed. He said, uh, you know, I didn't find any money, but I found maybe something even more valuable. And what was that? Well, it was a briefcase. And what was in it? Well, that's the thing. He pulled it out of the he pulled it out of the safe, and it was kind of heavy. And he was like, "Oh, it's about this going to be loaded with cash." He kind of runs right. out of the building or whatever, and he goes back and he. He finally gets to where he feels like he can open it up, you know, and he opens it up and he looks inside of it. Let's see what we got. Whoa. And he cannot believe his eyes. He's looking at Amelia Earhart's papers, her yes. passport, everything. Passport, suitcase. visas for countries that she was traveling through that she, yes. would, have, she would have needed when she landed there. Yes. Uh, you know, and and this is maps. A, I mean, everything. This, and, and so, and just to make this completely clear, this is a United States Marine who, when he was interviewed, was completely lucid. Yes, he's an older man, but he, yeah. there, there, there is. He is just as straight as the day is long. He reminded me a lot of my great grandfather. Actually, See, you know, it's funny you say that no. because he re- he reminded me uh, of how my grandfather uh, behaved. And look, these guys went through unimaginable things, right? Uh, and it made such an impression with them at such a young age. The, you know, again, these guys were eighteen and nineteen. Some lied. Some were seventeen, right? And uh, why to get in? Uh, well, why make this story up? Well, that's what that's he was enough. saying. It's like, look, I've I've said this. People think I'm crazy. And one thing he, he says in the documentary. You can present people with facts, and and they still won't believe. Yeah, you can it. hit them over the head. Confirmation bias. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't matter what I say. But like he said, why would I? What's the point of me making this up? He hasn't made any money from it. Right. But what he claims, and the other thing that he thought was interesting is like, well, she obviously everybody knows she ran out of fuel and crashed yeah, in the why ocean. Isn't the, the first thing he thought was, why isn't this stuff wet? Yeah, wasn't wet. Wasn't wrinkled. It was yeah. dry as a bone. Yeah. Never had never been wet. Yeah. So already he's thinking that that's kind of that's a little interesting. Uh, but of course, now the other thing about uh, uh, I know this also for my grandfather. When you find interesting things in the course of war, uh, if nobody claims him or if it has no military significance, you're allowed to keep that. Yes. Uh, my grandfather brought back a, uh, some rifles and pistols that you know he collected. No, you know uh, nothing of military. Uh, value yes. but if you could carry it they let you have it right so what the what the plan was you're supposed to give it to an officer he gives you a, a receipt and you know after they, they check it, it out you. they return it to you so right. he thinks uh well just a couple this, of days though before he turned oh it i'm sure he's yeah. looking at it yeah. I, I certainly would and yeah. in fact i think i may have kept the passport yeah. <laughs> you know just some I, just with me i think i would have kept a little memento yeah. not given the whole thing over because yeah. again it's not monetary or military value right uh no one's gonna die over that yeah uh, I think he so. probably had some fear, though. Between oh, the lines, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. it's like this is so unusual. Well, imagine, look, Scott. Imagine if you'd found a document that exposed the whole JFK assassination. Right, would be like, um, what do you do with that? Yeah. you know, do you really want that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Is that something that you're going to write a book, or you think that people are going to come after you? I mean, right. who knows? So, and so he goes, he goes down. I think he said he went down to the beach, right. to turn it in, and the guys weren't even in proper uniforms. It was Navy guys, and he's a Marine, right? And he, well, so yeah, there's a little just kind of well, like, there he, so he was looking for an officer. He looked, look, I got, I got to give this to somebody and right. get a receipt. Maybe I'll get it back. So he finds an officer, as he says, like a, a guy with a, with, a, with a scrambled eggs, which is like the gold leaf uh, uh, yes. a laurel on the uh, bill of the cap, so you, you know, worn by officers. So he finds this guy, and it was a little vague, but he, the guy's like, okay, I'll take it, gives him a receipt. He never sees the briefcase again. Right. Uh, no surprise there. No surprise. Once but, again, we have no hard evidence. But well, no, there's this no, is right. the most believable witness I've ever seen. Well, look, these, the case. yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Look, these guys... Uh, 
But he's not the last one. As far as military people in this documentary, so there's a third guy, Thomas E. Devine, and he's a he's assigned to the U.S. Army Postal Unit and on Saipan, and he wrote a book, Eyewitness, The Amelia Earhart Incident. So, okay, we're getting to an interesting point here because these guys aren't buddies on Saipan. That's They're right. not in the same unit. There are three different guys who don't know each other, okay? And their stories... They're all telling the same stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's interesting to me. So he gets in a Jeep. His commanding officer, he orders him to take him in a Jeep, go to the airfield, because he wants to see Amelia Earhart's plane. Okay, that's what I'm saying. It's not such a... People have found out about this by now. Right. So they get to the hangar, and who is there but Julius Neighbors guarding the hangar. Right. So he's there, and and of course, he's taking his duty very seriously. He's not letting them in. Right. And uh, so there's some arguing, of course. You know, it's uh, uh, Marines against Army. You know, they stop arguing, and the the army unit just says, you know what, uh, she crashed anyway. This has got to be baloney. Right. I mean, they're not, look, they haven't seen it, but everybody's talking about it. Of course it's news. Right. So they, they drive off. But, okay, so that's one connection between two guys who don't really know each other. The other thing that was interesting that Mr. Devine says is that he went to the Garapan prison... ...and saw the cell where she was supposedly kept, and he saw... The letters scratched into a wall, A-E. Somebody could have put that there. Who knows? Right. That's one little interesting bit. By the way, we have to come back to the uh, the non-military witnesses. Yes, we're getting we're getting yeah, that. We're, yeah. we're basically covering the three uh, guys yes. that uh, from this documentary anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they're again, they're, I think their clips are on YouTube. You can and it's just fascinating because they're telling a similar story where they kind of bump into each other. And the last part is Thomas Devine. There's a rumor that they're going to fly this plane. They're going to take it out for a spin. And he and neighbors saw this plane fly over. And what was interesting is they both said they saw the markings on it, NR-16020, which was Amelia Earhart's you know, plane identification numbers. Wow. They took the plane out for a spin. Come on, you got to fly it. It's, it's here, and it's a piece of history. And it's hugely top secret. What a, what a story. So. Right. So basically now, two guys have snuck a peek at this thing flying over. This is another interesting bit here. A man by the name of James H. Nichols, and he's a retired Navy intelligence officer. And he comes and retrieves the briefcase, and he reportedly oversaw the destruction of the plane. Right. So he's getting orders. Uh, and I read, read somewhere before that... Uh, His orders were to rescue right. Earhart... If she was alive at Noonan and get them out of there, or if they were dead, destroy all evidence of their existence there. Right. One of the guys, and I can't remember which one it was, took a Jeep, him and a friend of his. They rode down and snuck down. I think he said they drove down on the beach and snuck around up through the grass or something. Yeah, yeah. Laying down on their bellies. Right. And watched, saw with their own eyes, yeah. the plane pulled out of the hangar yeah. onto the end of the tarmac. And then a bunch of uh, guys jumped up on it and poured gasoline all over yeah. it. Yeah. Cleared it. And then they look up, this plane just unloads on it. It's also firing tracers. Yes. So firing those tracers. are incendiary rounds, yeah. like every fifth one. Or, right. And, and so it Sets lights it on fire. Lights it up. Yeah. yeah. And this thing, it burns all the markings off of it. Kind of helps make it unrecognizable. And then I think, is it cut up? And then... Yeah. Then they, they disassembled what was left of it yeah. after it burned. And buried it in the airfield, which was actually standard practice for destroyed aircraft. Ah. So it's um, somewhere... Right. So uh, Martini believes, that made the documentary, believes that it's buried there. Yeah. Uh, the guys who had went around in the Jeep actually got kind of scared. Yeah. And sort of well, ba- bailed towards the end of this operation. You know that you're looking at something you're probably not supposed, not supposed to, see. to see. Yeah. yeah. But they say the pieces were pushed off the tarmac and that it was buried at Asalito Airfield. Right. 
which Martini was planning to go back and oh, that's right. dig for. Yeah. Now, let's say, okay, well, what happened to Fred and Amelia? You know, well, one thing is they were, theoretically, they were offloaded off the ship. There was one of the, the in addition to all the military witnesses, you also have the uh, the villagers, the people, the indigenous people, who had described, some of them described uh, being told to turn, put their heads down, kneel down on the ground and took, put their heads down as these hostages were walked off of a vessel onto the island. And one man remembered looking up and, like you said, seeing um, Amelia and Fred with a, a bandage on his head, right. supposedly. Then there were people in the prison. There was a little prison called Garapan Prison, which is very small, and you can see it on our website, yeah. where they were supposedly kept in cells at opposite ends so they couldn't talk for years and interrogated for years. And there are numerous witnesses that saw them in, out, and around the prisons. There were witnesses that saw them uh, being driven around in a Jeep with their right. hands tied and blindfolds on in the back of the Jeep. Witnesses who did not know each other reporting the same thing, seeing them around the island. And then there were also witnesses to their execution. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. So a couple of the, of the folks, uh, Fred Gordner, who we mentioned before, he's the CBS newsman. He interviewed Jesus Salas. You know, he's a Saipanese farmer, and he was imprisoned uh, by the Japanese for whatever reason uh, there. And he claims that he saw Earhart. He was ne- in the cell next to her or very close by. He saw her uh, led in there, and I think she was there for uh, several hours and then moved away. And he asked, the guards told him that she's a captured American pilot and that he never sees her again. Mm-hmm. So that's one eyewitness. Right. Uh, another one, uh, Jose Pangelin, a grocer. He uh, remembers seeing a white woman in the second story room of a compound hotel a few times. All oh, right, in town. and uh, and also hears that she is a captured pilot and spy. Right now, this is the thing. I because I was wondering, it's like why hold on to her that long? I mean, we're not technically at war at this point in 1937, although you know hostilities are building and suspicions are building. Uh, but if they find a couple of spy cameras on the plane, this changes everything. Yes. You know, that's going to greatly upset them. Also, she's kind of the hard, a hard prisoner to release. If you're yes. in, during the search and all that, if you're not saying that you have her, it, it's it's a sticky situation. Also, I had read somewhere there was a photo album. Did you read about that? No. Uh-uh. Um, I, somebody had laid hands on a photo album that they thought was either hers or Noonan's that oh, had maybe. pictures of the Electra and all kinds of pictures from all over these, you know, different places. Oh, maybe I did, yeah. And that apparently that, that general that you were referring to, or whoever it was that was supposed to come clean up the mess, had right. confiscated that as well. There's one Manuel Manny Muna. He's a Saipan senator. Now, he said the captain of the Fuku'un Maru, this gentleman named Fuji Furomasa, told him that he was ordered to shoot down the Electra. Okay, now this is a, this is a senator from Saipan. And Muna said a prisoner... Jose Salas, I believe his name. He said he met Earhart, so that's all, that's also another person who had talked to this uh, Mr. Salas. There is a medical technician by the name of Bilaman Amaran, and he claims that he treated both Earhart and Noonan for injuries. Now, And he says that Noonan had a cut on his forehead and knee, and that goes to some other eyewitnesses who said the white man had a bandage on his head. Right. Okay, so as we said, there's a Marshall Island stamp commemorating the Japanese ship Koshu picking up the Electra. And so when MacArthur goes to investigate this, he talks to the captain, who, of course, claims that she was never on the ship. What the point is, is that there's enough of these rumors that to make the military go investigate this, or at least make it appear that they're investigating it. Yeah. Because people want to know. I mean, if, if there's some rumors, if enough eyewitness accounts... Well, let's see. And I think we should address, which we haven't yet, the, the end that, that they supposedly came yes. to. I mean, there's eyewitnesses of that as well. There was the girl who I think was the daughter of the police captain, Yeah, she right? was, she, right. She was the uh, daughter. supposedly saw Earhart taken out and executed. The, she was told to kneel before a grave that had been dug, and this really, this is kind of upsetting, frankly, but like, there was a hole that had already been dug in the ground, and they asked her to kneel, and she refused, and they shot her in the chest, and she fell into the hole. Right. Now, this, who saw that was uh, Michiko Sugita, and uh, her Sugita, father, right. Michio Suzuki, uh, he was chief of police in Saipan in 1937. Right. And I don't know, but I guess she was probably had access to, I don't think she wanted to go see this. I think, though, she was around when it yes. happened, and, and that's what she claimed she saw. And then there were later rumors of three Japanese soldiers who were involved in the execution who later talked about it. Right. Yeah, and then I can't remember what happened to Noonan. He was executed as well, I believe, 
Uh, I think he was well, decapitated. Yeah, he was well decapitated. Yeah, since he's the man, I yeah. think uh, that's a that's a samurai way of going out. Right, they just you know with the uh, katana and. Uh, you and know. this was theoretically up as as many as six or seven years later. It was prior to the liberation. Yeah. But some think only by maybe possibly even just a few weeks. Right. So the idea, though, is that the Japanese know that the, the battle, the end is coming. Right. The beginning of the end, as Churchill would say, is coming. And so let's kind of mop this up. Let's let's deal with this problem. Now, in 1944, Stars and Stripes, which is the uh, mag- Armed Forces magazine, printed an article saying two GIs named Hansen and Burke dug up the graves of Earhart and Noonan on Saipan. Now, I don't know yes. if that's and substantiated. Move, so they could move the bones, right? They yes. Move the evidence. Right, right. See, this is the thing. And, and it, we were talking about this earlier. Why would the United States cover this up, the right. military? Well, if you had – this is my thinking – is that uh, if you'd find them, it's great. There's a big celebration. We found Earhart. We found Noonan. They're, they're, they're fine. We, we recovered them. We liberated the island. If you didn't and they were killed, well, you kind of put this, and, and they were on a spy mission. Yeah. You, you know, truth or, or not, you kind of put them up to it. You kind of maybe help cause this. Pretty big fail. Pretty big fail. So you want to yeah. kind of maybe just put this under the rug, so yeah. to speak. So. Yeah, and also it it comes down to how do you deal with it diplomatically if the war is over? Yeah, it's what happens with Japan. How do you say, yeah. "Hey, you killed our, you know, well, you sent her over here." I mean, it's a disaster. Yeah, it's, yeah it doesn't it's like it's better that it goes away. Yeah. Now, if she's alive, well, I'm sure she's going to want to just play along. You well, know. Well, now, and let's get let's get on to that. And yeah, we can almost wrap this show up. The last thing I want to say is that Richard Martini did go back and dig up Aslito Airfield a year or two ago. I, I can't remember exactly when. And didn't find anything. Right. But he didn't really know where to dig. It's a right. big area. You know, they're just looking for any confirmation. And I think his plans are to go back again. And, he, you know, he's been criticized as not being super scientific about his methodology. But even those that criticize him, most of them are on the same page with him about the theory. Right. You know, and so that's that's kind of the the long and short of the whole thing. But when you look at the big picture of all of these choices – and all the theories that we've put forth tonight, and you ask me what I think, and you can ask, and we'll ask Forrest yeah. here in a second, but what I'm going to say is, well, if you watch the documentary, no matter how it's produced, and you see the interviews with these Marines who are lucid, clear-thinking gentlemen who clearly remember the history of what they experienced, and then also the interviews with all the indigenous people from the island who uh, the villagers and everything and all the things that they saw. Yep. And even if you say, okay, well, a certain percentage of these are apocryphal or it's hearsay or it's folklore or whatever, but the military guys, you, I mean, they know what yeah. the aircraft looks like. Right. They have no reason to lie. But then when you add the locals in and all the stories that they had that they're cooperating without even knowing each other, in my opinion, Amelia Earhart died on Saipan and so did Fred Noonan. I think so too. There's just too much eyewitness reports of this happening. Look, as Westerners, if you said like, oh, well, there's 10 villagers who saw a white lady wearing pants and a guy with a bandage on a his head. A pale white lady. A pale white In lady. In khakis. Right. I mean, they were very specific. Even then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even then. It's like, yeah, as, as the, you know, Westerners would say like, well, they don't know what they're looking at or whatever. You can, you can, you can cross that off. There are over 200 villagers, people from the island and the nearby islands, that have stories about this. That's that saw something. That saw the the people. They saw the plane. They they talked to people. It's too much out there. You know what I'm saying? Yes. To to ignore. Now, of course, there's no uh, hard evidence yet of anything. But w- w- what point does uh, eyewitness testimony outweigh, or at least measure up to, hard evidence? Right. A, a piece of metal with rivets in it which may or may not come from the plane, directional uh, readings that may or may not be correct. So at some point, what's interesting to me is that it's known where she was headed at up to a certain point, and at that point, it it jumps off. Well, and before we go on to the last little, and it's just a two-paragraph yeah. final theory, <laughs> there's another witness that we might have left out that I feel like is kind of important, uh, specifically as it relates to Fred Gurner's book. That would be Admiral Chester Nimitz, Yes. Like one of the most famous admirals in the history of the U.S. military. Yeah, he's, got a, he's got the largest aircraft carrier yes, in, the, in the world. Yes, the class. Name. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's a whole class of aircraft carriers in addition to the one, you know, flagship. 
Nimitz told Fred Gurner, the CBS reporter, and I quote, I want to tell you Earhart and her navigator did go down in the marshals and were picked up by the Japanese. Yeah. That's what Nimitz said. To Fred Gurner. To Fred Gurner. Yeah. yeah. Well, well. In a, in a 1966 letter to Amelia's survived sister, Muriel, Fred Gurner confided in Muriel Nimitz's disclosure of it having been known and documented in Washington that her sister Amelia had continued to exist under the auspice of Japan after she was reported missing in 1937. Well, there you go. I mean... All right, so then that's our final witness, Admiral Chester Nimitz. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's absurd. So I don't think he's in Nikamororo, or they were in Nikamororo, or the plane, I don't think that Tiger is, they're going to look at that anomaly, whatever, when they go back in June. I don't think it's Earhart's Electra, and... Even if it was, I at this point, I'm so convinced that Saipan was the end game that I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if the plane was ditched somewhere else yeah. after they were captured. Right. If it wasn't burned up on the runway, except I believe that because these Marines cross corroborated yeah. that story. Several. Yeah. And yeah. so I think the plane was probably destroyed on the runway. It all makes sense. It all comes together. It's so in conclusion, basically you have something that I think goes off of assumptions that they landed on an island and just lived out their days. But that's that's assuming a lot. Yes, and that's, assu- only that's assuming a, a lot of the of the end game here of the of, of the end result. Yes, hypothesis two. Hypothesis two: the Elgin Long crash and sink theory, which suggests they burned through fuel. They were out of position. They sighted the wrong vessel halfway. They were north of Howland Island, and they had to ditch when they ran out of gas from their struggles just to get to that point, and also right. being out of position. And so, so the, however, yeah. Nauticos went there with oh. all their sophisticated information and found nothing. Right. And appeared to have lost interest in it, frankly. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I mean, that's the, it's yeah. between the lines message on their website. I, you know, I can't speak for them, but right. it's like, we plan to go back in 2010. Yeah. And, hey, it's 2014, and that's the last thing you're putting on this webpage? Right. It's well, well like, how much money and time do you want to sp- spend on this? Right. Even if it's there, it's very unlikely that you'll find it. Then you really get sort of kind of off the deep well, end. There are people that suggested that all the messages that were supposed to take place between Earhart and the Itasca were pre-recorded on Earhart's side oh. to cover up the spy mission. And that was the reason that there was never any interaction between Earhart and Chief Bellarts on the Itasca. Wow, that's and that interesting. They, and yeah. that those were transmitted from rogue ships that the military had put into place to draw the picture of where they went down or where they were. And then maybe they were supposed to ditch on this island with provisions, like they suggested in the movie that Putnam supposedly sent the script in for. Right. I mean, you can start to reverse engineer all of this. Yeah. And so then maybe they were on this other course and they were going to ditch somewhere else, or maybe they were just supposed to ditch so that the the search could be used to do reconnaissance. Or I mean, there's a there's a lot of different things. It's that not can that happen. crazy though, because it, look, in World War II, uh, all the chips are on the table. And uh, Glenn Miller, the band leader, I yeah. think he did some spying. He was a known spy. Yeah, yeah. And actually, being a celebrity who's a world traveler, it's the it's a perfect cover, and it's been right. done over and over. Yeah, again. yeah. It's not that far fetched. However, in terms of far fetched <laughs> and <laughs> you gotta, crazy, we got to hit the last one. Before we sign off, right. We got to talk about Irene Bolam. Yes. Now. This, again, this could be another 45 minutes of discussion because there was a whole thing where there was an article that was faked and they had different yeah. women. They were faking the photographs to make her look like Amelia and all this stuff. I don't even want to get into all that. Right. I just want to say that apparently there was a whole theory put forward, and the guy talks about it on the In Search of episode, actually, oh, yeah. where Earhart did ditch and that she lived and was you know, secreted back to the United States where she took on the new identity of a woman named Irene Bolam and lived in New Jersey or Bolam. <laughs> right. Well, the, yeah, it's uh, the guy who puts forward this hypothesis, retired Air Force Major Joseph Jervis. He says he's been studying Earhart for over 17 years. He knows her better than his own mother. Right. Okay, now he says the real mission, again, we're starting on a, on a similar line here, and it diverges kind of wildly at some point. But he also says the real mission was to photograph the truck atoll where the Japanese were secretly fortifying. And then she was going to return to the U.S. with photographic evidence to present to the League of Nations to show that the Japanese were violating treaties. Right. So, and he, but he says the Japanese had an aircraft carrier stationed between Canton Island and Hull Island. And that a Japanese Zero, a fighter plane, shot her down, and she made a crash landing near Hull Island. So that's what he thought, yes. Yeah, that's, that's based on his, uh, on his research. 
And then, uh, you know, based on his interpretation of civilian radio direction reports, and then he finds an aerial photo, again, going back to the photo of Hull Island, where he believes it shows a Japanese flag yeah, on I Hull that near the Electra. So, yeah. yeah. So he talks to a former Japanese soldier named Ramon Cabrera, which doesn't sound very Japanese, I know, but, <laughs> <laughs> that it, but he was there uh, in 1937. Ramon. Ramon Cabrera. <laughs> so in 1937, a woman pilot was interrogated by a Japanese officer, then taken captive to Japan. Now, here's where this theory kind of you know takes a, a right or left turn, depending. Yeah. Because nobody had... That's a little further. Now yeah. you're getting even further away. Yeah. So she's taken to Japan and held captive in the Imperial Palace for about eight years. Okay, now here's the other interesting callback, or as you, I don't know what you say in, the, in, the, in showbiz here. Yeah. The tie-in, the callback, the button, Jacqueline Cochran, before the war, as the war is ending here, they secretly make a trip to Japan, and she removes Earhart before the U.S. occupation really hits full force, and she, and Jacqueline Cochran is disguised as a nun doing this. Right. Now, if you remember earlier what we said, Jacqueline Cochran was an aviator, good friend of Amelia's. Who was married to the RKO guy. Who was married to so this Mr. Odlum? That he thought, yeah, okay. So, and here's the other thing about this woman, Irene Bolum. A couple of things: a forensic analysis that a, a gentleman made. Uh, I can't remember what year, not too long ago. Between Amelia and Miss Bolum, concluded that their facial features differed too much for them to be the same person. Right. Right. Additionally, she sued. I can't remember who, but she yeah. sued whoever published a book saying that she was Amelia. She sued for a lot of money and yeah. won. Yeah. Oh. For like slander oh. or libel or something. Right. And she and there's press conferences where you can. Get, it's probably a YouTube video. Yeah. Well, there's a clip of her. Very she, adamant. she is not happy. Yeah. About these She's allegations. Like, I'm not right. Uh, you know. Because people are bothering her. The fantastic story, which makes me out to be some kind of a mystery woman, is utter nonsense. Oh, by the way, so, yeah, she went back to uh, Jamesburg, New Jersey. Right. right? Jamesburg. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so here's an interesting thing about Irene Bolum. And our least researched hypothesis, she was an active member of her church in New Jersey and had been going there for quite some time. And after initially refusing to comment about it to the press in 1982, in 1991, Monsignor James Francis Kelly finally admitted in a taped interview how his dear late friend, Irene Craigmill Bolum, indeed had been the former Amelia Earhart. He also mentioned how after the war, she stayed with him for three or four weeks as he helped her with her new identity, and he also afforded her ongoing counseling and spiritual guidance afterwards. Monsignor Kelly also described how, for her own non-specified reasons, she no longer wished to be known as Amelia Earhart. So that wraps up the longest show we've ever done. Yeah, I, I, I will be replaying this in our heads for years to come. Well, it's probably going to take me a month to edit it. Like, oh, wait, I've only got four days. Three. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. Come back in two weeks. We're going to have Mark DeAndre back, our guest oh, from yeah. episode number one. Awesome. Um, it's going to take us on a special tour of a famous cemetery. Very cool. I want to thank Judson Crane for our amazing theme music, Ryan McCullough for world-class sound design, and Jim Creative Design. But most importantly, we want to thank our listeners. You can find us online at astonishinglegends.com on Facebook at the Astonishing Legends Podcast, and also on Twitter. Copyright Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Good night.